Yo, how's it going, folks? Welcome to episode 148 of the Simple Life Podcast for the third time this evening and the last time because I'm not going to fuck up this intro. Um, welcome to new guests. I uh, had a video go semi-viral recently uh, this week, so about 60 to 80 of you people are potentially new, so welcome to the podcast. Um, strap yourselves in for quite a, a manic episode, it would seem, because I'm a bit over-caffeinated and, uh, as we were discussing, they're probably high off paint fumes because I've been painting all goddamn day. So, yeah. I apologize if this is manic. We will get to a serious conversation because we're going to jump straight into today's guest, who is an Irish cannabis uh, activist, advocate, and campaigner. They're the host of Martin World, the Martin's World podcast and a recent independent candidate for the Cork City Northeast constituency in Ireland. They are Martin Condon. How are you doing, brother? Doing good now, man. Yeah, thanks very much for having me. And I'm uh, glad that you uh, finally got through that. <laughs> me too. Me fucking too. Yeah. Jesus, man. I haven't had that bad of an intro run in quite a long time uh it's not to say that I'm, I'm nervous like i said i've just had a busy day doing diy and i honestly think i have probably inhaled too much primer paint uh which is why i'm a little bit away. and like i said that's not a drug that i'm going to promote people to use there are far more healthier safer harm reductive substances out there in the world and as always do your independent research about these drugs um yeah obviously we've had you on now i think third time fourth time coming back on now martin um the third maybe the fourth yeah Nice, yeah. nice. Uh, obviously, yeah, I wanted to get you back on quite uh, shortly after. Obviously, we had you on, I think, only maybe 15, 20 episodes ago, uh, because obviously you've announced this candidacy for, uh, well, to stand as an independent in Cork City Northeast constituency. Yeah. And yeah, I'm just eager and interested to hear what it is that you're sort of planning, what you're plotting, what your policies would be, you know, what your approach is. Yeah, well, uh, so far, um, I've been really well received. We've been out doing a bit of canvassing, just uh, going around door to door, uh, engaging with uh, the voters. With, uh, there's just a single leaflet there that I've been distributing. I haven't stuck any posters up on any of the polls. Don't really uh, agree with the whole posters and the polls thing. Um, that would be definitely something I would like to see changed. Um, what I would definitely like to see it replaced with would be more town hall style debates where the candidates come together um, up onto the stage, obviously, and uh, take questions there then from maybe local community groups um, or whatever the case may be, you know, there, there might be a host or some sort there. Um, I just believe the voters will get a lot more uh, value out of that than what they're currently getting with these uh, posters up in the polls um, mm. what it really is like who's got the most money to be able to stick their face around the, pl the place the most to get seen the most you know to be in people's minds the most um, yeah. in, in the hope that they, like because what, what, what I actually like most of the posters around the place obviously are over in the UK there now you, you won't be uh, aware of all of these posters that are up in the polls but they tell you very little about the candidates. Like, the, mm -hmm. there's one particular candidate here now. Um, I've reached out to this particular can uh, guy before. He he is an elected councillor. He's running again for re-election. Um, and I reached out for him for support. Uh, just after I got gotten out of Cork Prison, I was out in a temporary release. Um, I was after going to Cork Prison that time because I refused to pay the fine I had got for uh, the possession of cannabis uh, charge. Um, and I ended up having the, the I got a two month uh, prison sentence above in uh, car prison um, done five days of it got out as soon as I got out reached out to all of the local councillors this particular one like he's a poster around the place and it says talk to Joe like talk to Joe I, I reached out to Joe I tried to talk to Joe but <laughs> Joe didn't want to talk Joe didn't want to engage in this conversation or uh, with myself um, so yeah, I I don't feel represented by the likes of uh, Joe <laughs> or any of the other candidates that are out there. Um, so that that's pretty much why I said I'd throw my hat into the ring. Um, there's other people out there who most likely will feel the same as me. Don't feel represented by any of the candidates. Um, so I said, "Fuck it, might as well." <laughs> Yeah, why Why not exactly that? It's, uh, what's that old sort of adage? You know, somebody should do something, you know, wait a minute, I am somebody. I think that's just called that an adage, and I genuinely think actually now that's probably from The Simpsons. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Which well, is a good philosophical resource. 
if people don't like I suppose if, if I didn't run this time around there there isn't anybody there that's going to be willing to represent the cannabis consuming community um, there's nobody up there who's even I suppose equipped to actually represent them like even if there was somebody there that was willing to speak up like they wouldn't even know what the like again uh, we were kind of saying there earlier uh, what they would end up talk what, what would end up coming out would be more to the satisfaction of prohibitionists than it would be to the to the cannabis consuming community um, so again like this, this is why I suppose we need more people to, to be able to 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 step forward to put themselves out there um, if, I could, if I was to get elected um, obviously at the locals there's not a whole lot you can be doing in regards to the, uh, to the cannabis thing but I can uh, be writing letters I suppose in support to, uh, to the courts uh, and different bits and pieces there but obviously national legislation has to be affected uh, change from above in the Oireachtas above uh, in the Doyle uh, in Dublin um, where I would be getting elected to would be a local councillor, but there was there was one thing I did come across when I, as I mentioned there earlier, I got out of prison. I reached out to all of the councillors, and uh, somebody had said it to me it was like, "Oh, but the councillors can't do anything to help you in your your situation." And I I, I refuse to believe that because I I knew there was certain powers that uh, local councillors had, like they they can actually when when I went digging. Uh, local councillors can actually lift and put in place um, prohibitions, certain prohibitions that are in the interest of society, and and that's the wording of the the law that I came across. So mm. there there was a a, a a piece of legislation there that gives power to local councillors where they can actually put in place or lift prohibitions if they see it in society's interest to do so. Um, so I would wonder, like, you know, if I was to get elected to the local council, um, if I was to be able to explore that avenue a little bit, um, see if there was a, actually any possibility there or something I would like to, to be able to use that for, if, if I was able to, to lift a, a prohibition. Um, mm. I'd certainly lift the, the prohibition on the cultivation of cannabis, and I would allow people to be able to set up um, cannabis collectives, uh, uh, like not for profit type things, because obviously, mm-hmm. the the prohibitions would be, um, <clears throat> yeah, I suppose yeah, they'd be limited in what they they, they would be able to 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 go for, and I reckon obviously sticking with like social clubs, non profits would be probably the uh, the simpler way forward. That's just to begin with, uh, if that was something that was even possible, uh, if I was to be elected. <laughs> No, interesting that there is then the the language of such a thing because it's it's where most of the sort of the club models, the collectives, the um, just the models that have evolved around the world, where people have got together and managed to define discretion with their local authorities or the local policing institution, and the reason that they become sort of non profit in that sense to use that parlance is generally to avoid pocket is like proceeds of crime or the various other regional version of this uh, national legislation, which is to deal with money that is generated from the sale of uh, what they consider to be, you know, illicit and and, and um, unlawful substances. So, yeah, if you could, through that gex, man, my Irish history, how many counties is Ireland broken into? Uh, 28. So would it be just in by county by county? Is it how, I'm just trying to wonder how that, that would what is the language then? Uh, oh, 20, it, 26, sorry, Jesus, 26. When we go on with 28, <laughs> <laughs> um, so would other regions would that be something that you could champion in one space and then others around you could kind of seek to do it? it kind of in like how we saw the natural progression and evolution of the uh decriminalization models of uh Holland back in the day, where a few regions sort of started here and they went okay, and then it escaped that street, as it were, and then a neighboring town would kind of go, Well, oh, we're not going to enforce it because we do, you know, and it would yeah. move out of that. It, it, I mean, I'm just thinking, obviously, you're standing as an independent now, but I think. Even if it is non-profit per se, profit to me is money that is extracted from a region. You know, I'm not to give away my anti-capitalist inclinations here, but I believe that you can create thriving collective models. 
And I think that you could create such a system by which that then the local area would benefit and it would be harm reductive because all of the cannabis consumed in the local region would be grown to the highest standards by people that care and know about cannabis that instead of them being on the corner as a dealer, trying to just get enough so they can you know deal with whatever ailment they've got or just to relax at the end of the day, that they could have a, a job that's then paying into tax that's stimulating the economy. That It, it seems like a... A no brainer, but if you could, if using in this hypothetical a mechanism like that to show uh, an increase in in productivity, not in in social productivity, is that even a a concept? Life gets better, basically, is what I'm trying to describe there. Mm -hmm. Sorry, oh, there's a there's a question in there somewhere. Um, (laughs) uh, We know, yeah, I'm just like I said, I'm, I'm curious. Then, would you seek <clears throat> sort of allyship in others do you think this is something you could or you would see, sort of uh, spend some time investing into trying to find even a, I suppose more amongst the other independents rather than the party political candidates because they're generally held to you know the whip and the uh, the political line yeah well I suppose I wouldn't be looking to the lone wolf this uh, while at the moment that's how it is um, There, there's others out there I suppose uh, I was working with a uh, Another group there, the Cannabis Activist Alliance. Um, there's others out there. There's guys uh, involved with another group called Cron, uh, Cron, uh, the Irish word for trees. Um, so there's a lot of people out there, I suppose, really. So there, there's nothing stopping other people from stepping up uh, and running. The, the next general election is the important one, I suppose, as I mentioned there. It's national legislation that you should be really aiming for and targeting. <clears throat> Running at the local level, um, it's 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 good and it's drawn attention to the to the campaign, um, and it, I suppose the number of votes there that a a person might get on on, on a campaign like that, um, will uh, show merit to to the arguments that are being argued there by that person. Hell, as I say, like if I was to be elected, I I would be, <laughs> I would be rather shocked, I suppose, really, if I was to be elected. Um, given the fact that look, it's what it's a a two week campaign that I've been running there. Um, I haven't like as I said, I haven't invested a, a, a what all of the other candidates have there, uh, into the campaign. Um, but what I do have there, I suppose, uh, behind me is uh, uh, the fact that I'm an independent. Um, there's a lot of support there at the moment for the independents. Um, so if I can do well. Um, then maybe yeah, we could inspire more people to run come the general election. Um, it would be great to see more people to be running uh, with cannabis legislation there included as part of their campaign. I think yeah, a hundred percent. I think um, I did a little bit of delving. You know me, I like to be as informed as possible. And oh, I'm an Irish guest. There's an excuse to go look at some fucking statistics. I don't enjoy it, but I like to be as informed as possible. So I came across some numbers. We have my handy little cheat sheet here. So I think you can get quite, if you could somehow through the limit, obviously overcome the limitations of social media algorithms and everything else and the kind of uh, snooty kind of (laughs) scoffing that people will give you when they hear the word cannabis and independent candidate. Mm -hmm. Um, they should pay attention to the fact that since the the law has changed in Ireland, it's what I think fifty three patients have managed to get access. Fifty three. Compare that to I think forty thousand is where we're at in the UK. Uh, I think yeah. it's over a hundred thousand in Germany. Just to bear that in mind for people and put that into perspective, uh, the number of possession charges have spiked in the past three years in three out of the four guard regions in Ireland. Um, juvenile possession charges of uh, doubled in the past five years uh, in Dublin. I wish I'd have got the figures for Cork, but I couldn't find them. Uh, oh, p- possess- possession has increased in the past five years, charges by 54%. Um, and it's a weird thing because in Ireland, they were trying to push this thing and they were saying that, oh, we're going to have these like out of court settlements, as it were, as we had with our diversion schemes. But in the past three years, 17,000 people have still been charged and so, or summoned for simple possession alone. Uh, the, that sort of diversion caution system has cautioned uh, 5,139 people between December 2020 and February 2024 just for possession. So there's, you're not, you're, you're a beautiful isle, but you're quite sparse with people and population. And when you take that to be a percentage of people in these regions, yeah. there's a lot of people getting targeted for cannabis. There's a hell of a lot of people getting targeted. 
Um, there, there was a story there again recently in the uh, in the papers where a person uh, foolishly had grown some cannabis up in their window um, on full display, public display, <laughs> like um, cops seen it, came in, raided it, uh, raided the house, took the plants. Your man said that he was growing the plants, uh, was making a tea out of it, drinking it. Um, he wasn't even smoking it. Um, so, uh, again, th- this is how our guards are wasting their time over here. This is how the courts are wasting their time. And the judge in that, in that particular case actually said that uh, the the guy, when he comes back, that uh, he, he's in a dangerous position, that he could be looking at jail time for growing. Like, uh, I think he had three plants, maybe. See, that that's mental. So I wanted to contrast that. I just wanted to check this and pull up a resource... Ah, and they're all brags. Uh, screw it, we'll go into Sunday World. The worst fucking reference. It's like the Irish sun, isn't it? Sunday World. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Uh. MP Luke Ming F- uh, Flanagan. Mm-hmm. I've been trying to get him on the podcast for quite a while. I've been trying to speak to him for ages. Um. He did a thing over spring, summer last year, quite recently, where he grew a plant on in- on Instagram. And yeah. did this defiantly, said, you know, he's smoking cannabis and uh, he, he's can shit. I mean, that's quite a healthy looking plant. Um, yeah, he grew oh, it's, sem- it's 79X. I hate uh, fucking things. It's decriminalized from to grow it. So he was able to grow it out in his window, so legally. So how does, how did, how does this work? Because uh, he, there's two pictures, there's two plants in this picture I'm looking at from his personal X feed. Yeah. Uh, if, yeah, in front of his window in front of his window from Berlin oh right he lives in fucking Germany ah he's an MEP. thank you for clarifying that for me yeah right I did not know that okay he, he did that and he actually said that that uh, those posts uh, with the plant were some of the most engaged with posts that uh, he's ever put up on uh, his I can uh, imagine I can imagine and it, but it just even right. Like, thank you for clarifying the, uh, the 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 legality of the situation and how how it, I don't know how I missed that. Um, I obviously wasn't paying that much attention. Um, but yeah, there's still the juxtaposition of these two things. Like it's it it's you know one rule for thee and another for me sort of thing. It's it's very much. A, and I know it's we have national borders and governments and et cetera, but it, the fact that then serving in parliament for Ireland, granted then resident in Germany, because obviously that's where the crap, I can't remember what they call the MEP uh, parliamentary building. I'm terrible. It's because I've got Doyle going around my head over and over <laughs> again to not say Dahl. So that's the only parliamentary building I can think of. Um, but yeah, anyway, it, yeah. Uh, the, again, it just... <clears throat> Mm-hmm. And I know, obviously, again, fighting and, and being present in Europe, European Parliament is is different because technically, under the European rules, Ireland being a, a signatory and still a party to the European Convention and a, a member state, they should have been enforcing different laws, different rules. You know, there's been recommendations, you know, the CBD uh, edicts that have come down, Ireland and not going with that. There's still arbitrary licensing and restricting based on arbitrary numbers do you know what i mean they're still trying to keep the hemp lie going and all of this crap and like you said it, it just all seems to be going to the benefit of a new group of people that are going to create an industry and a neo culture on top of the bones of ours yeah the the last day i was in court myself um the judge uh actually said that she didn't want to hear anything about cbd so like, don't even tell me about cbd she said i don't want to hear it she goes, you, you, you're being charged with cannabis and that's all I care about. <laughs> she goes, I don't care about CBD levels or THC this. She said, you got caught. Co- it's been, it's charged with cannabis and that's it. Like, mm-hmm. Right. Jesus. <laughs> but it just shows the, how antiquated, how archaic these systems are. Mm-hmm. The, I mean, through their ignorance and obfuscation of a legal definition and correct scientific accreditation and, 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 and understanding of the nomenclature allows for all of this shit. It allows for, I'm not going to name any companies, but there's several businesses that just sprung to my mind right now in the UK that are making a killing selling CBD flour. Yeah. But that's unlawful. We had the discretionary cases of, damn it, Dr. Green, 
them maybe no that's not the business name oh my brain doesn't work so good today uh professor green maybe no Whatever the, whatever the company was, they basically got a court case. And what happened is there was a verdict that was done that it was lawful at the time because we were a signatory to the European Convention. Um, uh, oh, sorry, a party in part of it. So therefore, the protections of the European Court meant that they shouldn't have been charged under these offences. But that was a retrospective ruling since then. Many people have set up these businesses. And in other regions, other people are being raided for these again. Do you know what I mean? It, there's just yeah. this postcode lottery hypocrisy of... There's no rationale to it. There's no standardization to it. And there's no way to really navigate it unless you have money. Because all the people I know that have skills and, and experience, their money's wrong money. So they're still not allowed to play. Your druggies, your criminals are not allowed to talk to you. But then all the new money guys that then come and go, oh, we'll pay these these experienced criminal people or the people we've criminalized. They can then go in and create that system where they get a bit more of a wage and it's legitimate and they feel safe. But the big boys upstairs are making the big bank and they're making the decision. And it's like this, this token gestural representation. And there's people in the community and in the, the culture and in the space that are like always incremental. And it's like, yeah, it's incremental that they've only taken a piece of the pie right now because if you, they took the whole pie, you'd be pissed. They have to take it piece by piece. And you start there going, yeah, but look, we've still got this. And then they take another one and you go, we've still got this. And just, yeah, it feels like we're, we're, we're kind of fighting a losing war. I don't want to be sort of Debbie Downer, but like they've gentrified the concept of hemp. They've, they've stolen that and they've taken the industrial applications and clothing and all of that research and that's gone. And they used the weaponization of children and vulnerable people to then, you know, medicinalize and create this this pharmaceuticalized industrial complex. And then they've created this subsect of, oh, well, there's still then the skunk. And then there's the good people that can grow their own and they're safe because, you know, they're fine. But the other people, they'll still go crazy when they take it. They'll still stab each other. It still leads to all this crime. And still they're twisting themselves in these, these knots to try and create and perpetuate this narrative for the continuation of prohibition. And it seems like, like you said, that nobody has a rational concept here. Over in the UK, going into an election on July 4th, it's weird, actually. We, us and the Americans, I noticed this the other day, have flipped our kind of days. So we've gone July 4th, which is America's Independence Day, and then what could have arguably been our Independence Day, November 5th, uh, and Guy Fawkes, is, was, uh, was going to be theirs. Um, but yeah, we're, we're leading into this and Labour are basically like, la, 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 you've got medical, that's all you fucking need. You know what I mean? We're going to piss off the, the industrialists and talk about the hemp stuff like Jesus, no. Then you've got Tories who are probably the closest to legalisation. It wouldn't surprise me as a Hail Mary if they actually announce, like, uh, we'll look at it just to pull the youth in. You know, they've pissed off enough of them with the national service idea. They'll be like, wait, 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 yeah, national service, growing our weed. <laughs> you know what I mean? Honestly, I can see I can see that kind of reality. Then you've got like the Green Party who are a bit more rational on it, but they haven't updated their policies in forever. And then you've got the Lib Dems just sat in the corner fucking going, well, we'll still decriminalise, decriminalise, but they have no secondary and third sort of policies and, and conceptual ideas of how that would phase into a, a viable system other than just feed into the worst aspects of, of capitalism and criminality. Yeah, our, our Green Party over here, they, they, they sold us out last time. Um, they they got a big U vote, uh, I reckon, because of the their election manif <clears throat> excuse me, uh, their election manifesto including cannabis legalization. Well they they had a cannabis decriminalization that uh Amsterdam style coffee shops or something uh, it was kinda how they listed it in their election mm. manifesto, but <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Then when it actually came to government formation talks, they screwed, they shafted us. They 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 dropped it like like they, no bothers, no questions asked. As I can't like, absolutely say, oh yeah, I don't know, no, we're not we're not tied to that. Yeah, it's gone. And that that's the thing they did it as the uh, they, 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 yeah, the it works beautifully for both ways for them. They get to look progressive, they get to win some votes, and they know that they can then give that up to yeah. the less progressive parties uh, um, in negotiations to form governments. And it's, I, I I respect and appreciate, I know it's a lot more complex and obviously this might sound like a bit of, I don't know, there might be some historical thing here that I'm not thinking about, but I respect the fact that Ireland is a lot more broken in terms of, broken down in terms of its party political representation because it, it 
doesn't allow for like what the fuck we've just seen with the 15 years of Tories just pissing in people's faces and going, it's raining. And people going, well, I'm pretty sure it's not, but the paper's saying it's rain. Everyone around me's saying it's rain. Maybe it is rain. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And so the, I, yeah. but I still think we'd all win from proportional representation so that the cannabis party could stand somewhere because like I said, unless we stand and we've tried it before in the UK with like the LCA and various other things like sister cannabis is safer than alcohol. Mm-hmm. Although that was, that was again, very, very Tory light, very investment money funded mm-hmm. from what I've seen. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, unless there's this authentic grassroots movement that could genuinely get that representation because we are millions strong in the UK and in yeah. a good proportion of the Irish population. I mean, it's, I can't remember who was it. Was it Herb or somebody like that? One of those media outlets. Put Ireland like right up there with like percentage of smokers, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. If I, based on the last election here, if I only just got like freaking less than half of the consumers um, in this constituency, the those over eighteen to go the to come out and vote and, and give me a number one, I would actually get elected on the first count most likely, mm. um, because we're 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 that strong uh, in our numbers. Um, <clears throat> some estimates may make up that like it's what twelve fifteen percent of uh, of those over eighteen uh, have consumed cannabis at some stage, like in the last uh, twelve months. Um, so that's that's quite yeah. large. Yeah, you know, you've just triggered something in me um, that I haven't really thought of. I, I brought it up with Callie Seaman the other week. Uh, the World Health Organization, I cannot remember the absurdly long title of the the uh, study, but it's the one that came out and basically went, uh, un, what is it, 15-year-old girls in Glasgow are smoking the most cannabis, like a, a teenage girls around the world. Uh, and it was like 13-year-old boys in Newcastle were X, Y. It was, yeah, it was that thing that I referenced. Yeah. Um, but if you look at that over a trend, like youth consumption increases in places where it's criminalized. Yep. Then in America, where we look where it becomes lawful, it it dissipates. And it's not because necessarily they're not doing it. They'll try it and they may very well enjoy it. And then, But then they'll choose to kind of wait for later because they still face consequences in a lot of places like in Canada and face criminalization for youth uh, in juvenile possession. Do you know what I mean? It's it's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, so, But on the main fact is my dad smokes weed. That's not cool. And we need to get ahead of this mechanism that when legalization kicks in and all those kids that kind of are going to transfer into this, basically what I'm trying to say is there's going to be a huge glut of new consumers and new people coming in the space. And most of their experiences are with things like extracted uh, uh, fucking vaporizers. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like they don't know how to identify, but they wouldn't know mold pesticides, fucking PG. I don't have a clue about any of these other things that they should consider as a cannabis consumer mm-hmm. because they're jumping straight into this thing. And we know what capitalism does. Just look at the tobacco industry. I'm not equating cannabis to tobacco here in terms of, oh, 50 years, we'll all find out X, Y, Z. No, like it's the most studied plant on the planet. We know what it is. It's not going to be the same as, as cannabis. It's the opposite. If like where tobacco, they created a product, they mass market it. They got doctors and shit to promote it. They then basically created the whole idea of like the Marlboro Man and all this like they were in, intrinsically involved in uh the uh what the hell was freud's cousin called sorry my recall memory today has not been good and i'm definitely blaming that on the paint not the caffeine <laughs> um uh the hell was that? i can't remember his name but he was uh edmund benez i think was his name um and he basically came up with like mass marketing techniques and it was taking freud's because he was freud's cousin his psychoanalytics and mixing that with like pop culture and, and mass marketing cigarettes companies were hugely involved with this and so then for decades they hid the harm of this whereas it's the opposite for cannabis even now as they're pushing it out they're hiding the benefit of it we're not allowed to say the word apoptosis, cancer, and cannabis in the same sentence. No one's allowed to say that. I, c- I can pull up 50 papers right now. I can, I can bring up fucking at least four people I know that we as an organization formerly helped in Durham that are here because of this process, but we're not allowed to talk about it. Because no, 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 not yet, not yet. We're doing this now. Then we're going to do this. Then when we've got the, the cannabis inhaler for these people, then we're going to, yeah, the cannabis pill for these people, then the, this for these people, and... Do, do, do you know what I mean? It's it's yep. this this huge fucking and the problem there is capitalism. It's greed. It's the same that then if there isn't a capitalist market there or a a free like what's free market uh, there, then you're gonna have a drug market. 
And that's going to be ruled by the same greedy people that then use violence to control it at the higher levels. And they, when the police are picking off the easy fruit of your dealer Dave and your hippie guy that just grows it on his windowsill to fucking drink it as a tea, then yeah, you create a harder and harder situation. You create the the, the problem that you have around you. Mm-hmm. And they're aware of that. And it kind of feels like, like I said, they're playing both sides. They're investing like Jackie Smith. Jackie Smith. Fucking former Home Secretary in this country, responsible for reclassifying cannabis from a B to a C. She's now on the fucking advisory board of Del Getty. Del Getty. Still feel bad. I, I butchered the pronunciation of that in one episode for like fucking 10 minutes. I was sat going, I can't remember this name. So now every time I say it, it's Del Getty. It's fucking Del Getty. And she sits as an advisor on that now. And she's talking about, oh, yes, we have to increase funding and access to medical cannabis. And it's like, bitch. It, like, and I don't say that misogynistically. I just mean like, fuck you. Like, you dick. It's, I don't know, I was going to say it's a gender appropriate term, but it's not necessarily actually at all. But yeah, just dick move. Like, you know what I mean? And then to then in 10 years later be in this position and to not have, you know, to say that you, you apologize and you've learned the lessons, but you haven't. You're just being paid to say this little bit is fine. All the other people that don't fit in this, that guy with his plants on his windowsill, he doesn't fit into that model. He's a bad guy. He's as bad as the kids on the bikes that are stabbing each other up on the estates for 20 bags. Well, that's what they're getting treated by, like, uh, by these judges. That's how they speak to him. Um, and that's mm-hmm. that's the kind of, a lot of the times, the outcome as well uh, of the cases. You know, the the, the lads uh, that are going around with the knives aren't getting as uh, harsh as the, the lads growing a couple of fucking plants. Well, that's the, the, again, the, the weird thing of it all. It's reform. So I'm not then going to try and park morality here, folks, uh, and just just speak of this in just sort of cold comparative things. If then somebody carrying a knife in the street, I know and I have empathy and sympathy for the argument of if you live in a place where everyone's carrying a fucking knife, you want to carry a fucking knife. Do you know what I mean? I can understand that kind of mentality, but still then by being in that space and operating in that way, and I know, again, it's... That's speaking from a point of privilege here where I don't have to live in that sort of reality. I know that is sort of a, a reality for, for some, but the interventions there where they look at as victims, the system then goes, oh, no, 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 we'll do a diversion scheme. So youth intervention, oh, we need to look at housing. We need to, okay, we can help you move to another area. We can, there's an understanding and a sympathy from the system there. But then when that same system looks at that person going, you, how dare you? In defiance, you know it's wrong to grow that plant. And you grew that plant. Yeah. Like you say, it's just... it's where's it? Even the idea of reform of going, oh, I made the mistake and I grew this plant because yeah, I got hooked on the weed. They don't even believe their own rhetoric of, you know, you get hooked on cannabis and I've got to grow it to make it cheaper. Do you, do you know what I mean? It's like they have all these these narratives and this pathway. Like I said, the, none of it makes sense. None of it connects. Because like you said, as soon as one of us challenges it, ah, pothead, don't listen to him, dirty hippie, doesn't know what we're talking about, stoned. Granted, obviously, this podcast is not helping that argument because, uh, but I'm not blaming the weed, I'm blaming the pains. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, well, definitely, you you step up and you challenge it. Like, uh, initially, you might get some kickback. Uh, I, I suppose I did, like, but I, I'm rather surprised, like, that I'm not getting a lot more now. Like, I suppose going around over in the, on this uh, election campaign, I, I've been really well received at the door. There, there's nobody telling me, you know, I'm fucking, oh, go away, you, you druggy or whatever, you know, when, when you're talking about it. I suppose I'm not getting straight in off the bat and being hitting drug policy off the nail, uh, hitting it as the first thing like you're dealing with, with somebody. You might talk about community safety um, because, mm. look, fucking, I've got four kids myself as well. Community safety is important to me as well as it is to other people. So I could talk about that and uh, I could talk about like fucking how our guardy, uh, our guards over here, our police, um, they're they're very ineffective at what it is that they do uh, in keeping us safe um, while they're wasting so much of their time. And then I can go in and talk about drugs then from that point of view, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, look, you mightn't have any fucking skin in the game you, you feel when it comes to having a conversation about drugs but meanwhile you have a conversation about community safety and now you talk about police force and wasted resources you know and now you, get, you take somebody who didn't have any skin in the game and now you get them in and you know you get them on your side and uh, you, you might win a vote <laughs> and yeah, I have yeah. 
Yeah, like I suppose I, I don't try to change anybody's mind if there's somebody at the door, you know, and if they're coming out and they're they're staunch, some like hard cemented in their their thing. Um, I w I wouldn't waste a lot of time there trying to change their mind. Um, but to be fair, I haven't met anybody at all like that. Um, to nobody who's been like really hard in their views. Um, I met one or two people who like would have challenged, like questioned, like one one or two things I might have said. Um, but then was well able to answer them, and uh, yeah, I think I won them over by the end of it. I think exactly that's the thing is most people are two reasonable responses or two <laughs> questions away from actually stepping down from their bigotry. Mm -hmm. Like you said, it's the vast majority of people now are aware of their own cognitive dissonance and biases, or at least the conceptual idea of them, even if they don't know them by those names or they know these concepts uh, in a, what the hell is, I suppose it's, it's anthropology in an anthropological sense. Um, you understand that, wait a minute, that I can change my mind and the older you get, typically I like to hope, at least or as I've found from my experience, I'm more capable of changing my mind. Sometimes it may... I may be stubborn about it and I may be resistant and I may be but eventually the truth is the truth is the truth and I think most people that are against cannabis are pro-safety they, they believe cannabis funds terrorism they believe that the weed sneaks in and gets the kids and ruins their lives and take it they, and they you know you'll meet maybe one out of a thousand They'll be like, no, medical doesn't exist and it's all just a lie and you're all just trying to get high and you're all wrong ones and everyone should be sober throughout that. And they're like, they're addicts in and of themselves, usually. They're teetotal people. They're like, what they call them, a uh, straight edge. They're like, no, if life's hard, you've got to go through it. It's like, no, nah, mate. Let's say like rice exists. Are you going to eat that instead of experiencing the, the the spices of life, the flavor and variety of food and, and things that are available to you? And that's what... What I, I see drugs as, the older I get, is they're just herbs, vegetables, they're additives to life, the things you can do. You know, I could eat as people are now. We're eating fucking, what is it, the like the gherkin challenge and the fucking hot chip challenge and the fucking pepper challenge. And they're, they're having effectively psychoactive experiences from fucking foods. They're fucking themselves up just for the hell of it. You know what I mean? Dolphins pass around puffer fish. Elephants impact uh, fruits, fermented fruits to get drunk. Birds eat uh, b b uh, rotting berries. You know, there's observational behavior throughout a lot of uh, the uh, animal kingdom that shows shit likes to get fucked up. Stuff likes to take drugs. It likes to alter its consciousness. Do, do you know what I mean? It's my cat with catnip. Jesus Christ. Do you know what I mean? He has, he has a psychedelic Sunday every Sunday. I look at him and I go, and as soon as he has a packet, the packet that's got like 25 bite holes and scratch holes in it, it's like his food is on his level. He could easily get to his food and have any biscuits he want, break his dreamies open, any of his treats. But the catnip, I have to put in a fucking cupboard on the high shelf because he figured out he could get into other cupboards. So it has to be behind like a locked bolt cupboard. Things like to get high. <laughs> and if we refuse to acknowledge this, all we're ever going to do is create uh, a two-tiered kind of way of looking at life, a, a shame. Do you know, we're having this sexual liberation that's been going on since the 60s and people to be proud of, you know, how they, their sexuality manifests as long as it's lawful, as long as it's two consenting adults or maybe more consenting adults, as long as they are at least adults, they at least consent, whatever y'all get up to, it's your business. Do you know what I mean? It's your fucking business. And I'm extremely libertarian on that point. You know, you can do what you want. That, that's your expressions of it. I still think there should be certain things of like, I don't want to see a dick in public. I don't want to see a vagina in public. I don't want to see genitalia in public. Do you know what I mean? It's so that would be my only criticism of things. So, uh, and yeah, there's a limit. Yeah, <laughs> and the same should then be true of of drugs. Even though I am extremely pro libertarian of, of then of drugs. You know, if somebody is completely mashed off their face on acid in a high street on a Tuesday, mm. problematic. At a festival on a weekend, surrounded by thousands of other people, and there's music and what set and setting and correct environments. It's the whole reason we adopted pubs and working men's clubs and these other things is we understood that people like to drink. And hey, well, how do we help regulate that? People drink together. So Dave goes, Bob, you've got too many. And he shouts over to the barman and the barman shouts to the fucking taxi guy and the taxi guy comes a bum and he's home before he knows it. And the whole village and everybody looked after each other and everyone would moderate. And then what happens over here in the UK? Tony Blair, Tony fucking Blair decides, let's have a cafe culture. 
who goes to continental Europe and goes, oh, it's really nice here. Look at all this shit. Forgets the fact that the vast majority of this country is freezing fucking cold. I bitch about the weather every goddamn week of being a northerner here. Like, the, we don't have the same vibe of it. So we just went, oh, licensing laws. We'll adjust to that. And what will happen is people will have a half of a wine in an afternoon with their dinner. Nah, man. Look at the fucking football games now. Look at the fucking gathering that just happened in London. Like, I talked about this thing of that clip that just went viral last week of, of cocaine. People that are now on the sesh, they don't, they're not even doing cocaine as a drug. It's just once cocaine is added to alcohol, that's alcohol plus. Do you know <laughs> what I mean? I just, just, I just wanted to spice up my alcohol. And actually, the only reason I sniff cocaine is to stay sober. So I get really drunk and then I always get a bag and then I'm sober again and I'm fine and I can go again and I can drink more. And then oh, I need another bag though. And then I get sober again. And it just, and I've got no problem to that behavior. If it was truly informed of the potential damage that they're causing to themselves, if they understood the consequence of where those drugs are coming from, not for me being a prohibitionist, but if you listen to Colombia and Bolivia, they want a fucking lawful cocaine trade. Yeah, they man. recognize they could help millions of people in their, their country. They could start to tackle the fucking cartels. They could put billions, if not trillions, over a, a period of time back into the global system. There, yeah. There's so much good that could be done by just having a rational conversation with with people on drugs. It go as far as cocaine, to be fair. Like, even just the coca leaves in themselves. Like, if you were able to get access to coca leaves, there's different ways in which you can use coca leaves where you don't. it doesn't involve having to, to snort cocaine in order to get those stimulating effects. Mm -hmm. Um and, and I suppose it doesn't have the it wouldn't have the the, the devastating uh, consequences that could be associated with uh, excessive cocaine use, such as massive bills. <laughs> well, I mean, the, but that's that's the irony of it. So if you then look at it, the price of a kilo of this is this video is going to be so just rejected by YouTube for everything that we're talking about. Oh, no. um, but hey, hey, that happens every week. Um, the price of a kilo of cocaine. Uh, do I have to throw in the word allegedly here, YouTube? Am I going to get in trouble, Spotify? Okay, we'll just keep talking. Uh, in one of these countries in northern South America, as in the northern countries of South America, is fucking few hundred, few hundred dollars relatively. It is fucking nothing. You can draw, imagine, I can't remember what the form of the graph is because it's a long time since I studied math. Uh, if you lay over like segments coming from South America up to say Miami, there's ringlets where it becomes more valuable as it bounces across because of the number of people that then become necessary to, to move it. Yeah. It's obviously, it's not like cannabis production is now where you need lights and newts and feeds and whatever else like coca leaf fucking grows in south america it grows and they've had centuries of indigenous use of dealing with like altitude sickness that you chew it you know it's been a cultural drug it's been a, a spiritual and sort of uh, religious uh, sacrosanct and uh, sacrament sorry and like a uh, ritual rite of passage and yeah, obviously the cocaine industry. And I can't see a problem why you couldn't replace like the kerosenes and the other extremely toxic things that are used in the production of cocaine before it's brought into the, the European or American market and cut with God knows what. And then to little street corner dudes, the guy that's dropping it off to you and what he's cutting it with and how he's doing. Like there could be ethical cocaine, there could be ethical heroin. And I think the more we move forward, the more these arguments become kind of self-evident in the, if you then provided coca leaf, people are then going to hoard that coca, coca leaf and at home figure out chemicals that they can mix and make cocaine and they'll end up on the street. We have to understand these things. The drugs are not the problems. The drugs are a, a symptom. So if you look at uh, an amazing study by a guy called Bruce K. Alexander, a Canadian uh, psychiatrist and... God, I can't remember his fucking full title. Sorry, my, my recall isn't too good today. Um, but he created a thing called Rat Park in the 1970s. And it was as a response to the argument that drugs are addictive full stop. So you had Nixon and Reagan and this lot being like, fuck, I know these drugs are going to kill and, and destroy and, and like one pill, one puff of a, a, a weed cigarette, a jazz cigarette, and you're addicted for life sort of thing. And what they did is the studies to prove that is they put like rats in horrible cages, confined positions with no food, no stimuli, no nothing, terrified fucking things in places that smell of death and of urine and of feces and all of the horrid things that that animal could associate, you know? And then they give it the option of drugging itself. And then they were like, oh, it's really weird. This, this rat likes lots of drugs. And they were like, ah, oh, 
<laughs> oh, everything likes drugs, 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 chemical hooks, bad. And Bruce K. Alexander created this wonderful paradise uh, this, uh, for these, these creatures where they had mates, they had friends, they had food, they had stimuli, they had places they could grow and climb. And what they would find is that as the sort of group sort of progressed through their, their stages of life, as it were, that they would dabble with drugs. But often what they would find is it would be as a form of like self-soothing, a form of rejection. They maybe lost a sexual partner, maybe uh, the missus ate two of your kids and you go back to the cocaine water, you know, and you're just like, fucking hell. Because, um, you know, it's stresses of life. And so we can observe from those behaviors the same sort of things. It's like everybody innately is curious to try drugs. There's a reason, I mean, I don't know what other people call it, but we call it dizzy ducks. When mm-hmm. kids spin around until they basically fall over. Before you end going through puberty and you have like a, a neurochemical death where you like you purge neurons and shit in your brain and your brain structure actually physically changes, you don't get dizzy in the same way. So what is happening is they're getting high. They're having a neuroendorphic response to it. They are triggering a, a high sense for themselves. They're, they're self-stimulating with a, a, a drug. And these behaviors, like I say, are so intrinsic to us. And we can look at all of those models, but then somehow when we look at society and go, oh, that's his fault, that's her fault, that's their fault. We can't recognize the way. Yeah, but if you lived in a piss-stained fucking sleeping bag under a bridge and you haven't eaten properly in six months, you haven't showered in fucking a year, you have, do you know what I'm like? Yep. What would be your one thing to go for? That Tesco sandwich that day or that fucking hit of brown that's going to make it all go away? Like, it, it's a rational response to an irrational world. And the argument, like you were saying before, all of the, the, the people that are like, oh, no, but legalization and we can do all these things, and they are still missing the morality. They are still missing the empathy. They don't get it. They're full moralizing. You're going, oh, we shall save them. We don't need to address our foreign policy and the consequences of that. We don't need to address our domestic policy and and houses and right to buy and what fucking Thatcher's legacy has been for fucking 40 years. We don't need to talk about the economics and about these boys from the same school somehow getting to be the leader every single time and us having free elections where the same dickheads rise to the top to do bull dickhead shit. Like, we're in this, this system where... Of course you are. So whether it's the McDonald's or your cheeky little Starbucks or it's fucking heroin or it's kind of cocaine or cannabis or whatever it may be, wherever it is, whatever it manifests as, you sat there for four fucking hours swiping on Tinder. Whatever that, it, with all those behaviors are maladaptive behaviors because our fucking environment is wrong. We need to build Rat Park. We, we need to get back to this shit. The answer isn't in more of this for all again, all of this technology and all of these conversations, but we should be sat together. We should be free to be around each other. It shouldn't cost us, oh, it's going to cost us a fucking tenant to get on the fucking, uh, get a taxi over to you. And then, oh, we've got to have drinks and then minimum of this. And you end up, before you've even sat with somebody, you've spent 20 quid, 30 quid. We just don't have the, the park bench to sit on. Do you yeah. know what I mean? We don't have the, the green space to meet up at and sit and have a cheeky little smoke at anymore. Like we've lost more and more of the common space to private enterprise. We're getting so close in Europe to the American loitering system, which from all my experience in the States is being in public without spending money. That's what it feels like. And I don't, I, I, this room's small enough. This, my life, it's a small enough space I live in. I yeah. don't want to self-impose being in here because then I grow to become anxious because I'm inexperienced. The muscles atrophy of socialization. We all experienced that during lockdown. Those first times we got back together and we're like, is it weird? Am I stood too close to you? Like, how do we talk? Like, what are like, do you? And like, for the first year, I was still like meeting people and like, do you shake hands? Are we still hugged? Can we hug? Are we, because everybody had a different fucking response. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And that shows again that these things that, if you were homeless, if you were in deprivation, if you were in distress, if you were in a difficult situation, it can become difficult to figure out how to be you again, mm-hmm. how to act with the social norm, to to behave to a, a, a degree of etiquette that others can the, believe is the accepted norm, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, you're, you're, you're fucking dead right. Um, we definitely need to uh, improve this uh, place that we live in. Make it uh, more like that rap arc. <laughs> it's definitely more, more, uh, less natural, I suppose. The the way that we're living these these days, especially like fucking the the social media, the doomsday scrolling, like you know, you're just the mm. fucking, yeah, algorithms. The way it's constantly just hitting you with uh, a lot, lot of the, a lot of negative kind of stuff, really. Um, yeah. 
it's it's not natural and I think the people who are affected by it the most I suppose as you say like uh, are the vulnerable people out there um, there there is a lot of vulnerable people out there you know some people are able to get by and you know brush it off and it doesn't affect them so much but yeah other people do uh, get pretty fucking affected by um, the the unnaturalness mm. of the the world um, get dragged down by that mm. fucking uh, doomsday negative wash that comes over them like especially as I said like young young kids um, that's something I've been talking about a lot lately is uh, just uh, the the whole mental health um. Uh, space here in, in in Ireland like uh, unfortunately I've had to deal with uh, the mental health services um, so you kind of see the gaps that people fall through within within these services um, and it's no surprise then you know that's a person like when they fall through these gaps that they find things like you know fucking whatever it might be cannabis cocaine fucking alcohol um, you know, whatever it might be, uh, that that fills that gap for that person when they fall through the gap in those services. Mm. Um, so it's just unfortunate, like you know, uh, we we've got a recruitment embargo that's uh, still in place uh, over here, um, where they're they're able to take on these fucking private contractors in the health service, but they can't actually hire nurses and doctors and stuff like that. It's that's so fucked up because again, all of the it's jobs for the boys. But yeah. boys and girls, I'll be fair, you know, jobs for the whole, jobs for the homies. It's yeah, it's it's open, open corruption, and it's it's yeah, it's. I agree that to it to a certain degree that the mental health services are failing, but the conceptual idea of charity of mental health services should be repugnant to, to kind of paraphrase Kennedy's last speech in, in a free and in fair society. It, it shouldn't be. The way that it is, and yes, we should be mental health services because anybody can fall into distress. Mm -hmm. But in the ideal world, society should be geared in a way that we recognize each other's distress. And I feel like we fucking used to. Until and it was, I remember it, one of the Nokias. I remember when the camera appeared on it and I was like, it's only three megapixel. It's fine, it's fine. And nobody pulled it out of parties and everybody got on it. Everyone still did then live their fucking lives. But once it got up to like 10 megapixel and shit and people could actually... And then MySpace and then fucking Bebo and da 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 and then Facebook and, and this acceleration and it just um, it became almost like instead of people sessioning together and partying and having fun and celebrating and being minging together, being messy, being like two days into a fucking bender in a field at a free party. Do you know what I mean? I had taken whatever God knows drugs, but have kept each other safe and been in that community and, and, and experienced that together, you know? Um to now People are scared to do that around each other or they'll set each other up for it. So then if as long as he's ketty and fucked up and people are recording that, I can get messy and no one's going to judge me. And it feels like that's extrapolated out to the whole experience of humanity now, that people are almost... This is why I see so much dogpiling and so much binary division of, oh, we're pro this, we're anti this, we're left, we're right, we're blue, we're red, we're... And it's just majority. They then look at their algorithm, and go majority say this. So I'll be this. I'll be this. It's 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 broken us away from uh, chemically being able to recognize in our own brains what the fuck we think, because mm -hmm. since we've developed, I don't even know what mine is. These fucking things, it's it's become a surrogate. It's become. Uh, an external force by which we trigger and stimulate and seek to, in our own belief, air quotes, control our neurology, our neurohormones. That we can go, oh, oh, school, oh, and, oh, look at all the likes, look at all the thing. I'll admit that. Like, I, I had a fucking a, a YouTube show, like I said, blew up last week. I think it's like nearly 14,000. That's way above my average. And I clicked on the thing. What the fuck? I've got like 60 new subscribers. Like, I felt, the th I felt it. I felt the oh, wash gosh. of it in my brain. Oh, do you know what I mean? Whereas before that's like today, that was exactly a, a similar response to then today when I finished painting, finished that second coat, I slapped the brush down and my wrist and just blah, and I was like, eh. began probably in the fumes of all the paint, but the relief of it, the job is over. It's complete. And yeah. And it's like, the brain doesn't care where the stimuli comes from. It doesn't care what triggers the thing. This is how people end up with like kinks and fetishes and all kinds of things that, you know, there's people that get like turned on by cars. There was a guy who married a bus recently. There's something I saw. I read too much trash on the internet. Um, but yeah, <laughs> people do. They've been married inanimate objects. They have then these attachments and these things. It's, I think it's, 
there's a warping there because there isn't almost a perception of enough for all. Mm -hmm. It's almost like the opposite of being a kid or from what I hear from my friends about because I didn't have a mainstream school education experience. So I went to schools with very few pupils, but very large amounts of staff um, or residential carers, whatever you want to fucking term them. Um, But you would have such an abundance of people around you. You could pick and choose your friends and you go through groups and you, and for some people in some classes, uh, I don't mean classes in their schooling, I mean as in their social class, dependent on your trajectory and sort of life, you may never not experience anything outside of that. But for a lot of people, once they leave schooling, unless you jump straight into employment, and even if you do, dependent on what level you enter in, into what role, yeah. if you haven't developed those social skills and got the th- you society isn't geared for you. I say this is some neurodivergent individual. Like I'm very confident and happy when I'm on stage, when I'm talking on air or I'm doing whatever, but there's so many times when I'm just outside, I'm just like, I have no idea how you people operate, what the rules are and what you expect of me. What the, what do you want me to do here? I'm going to go for a smoke down the river. I'll see you later. Yeah. Do you know what I mean, <laughs> it's, and there are so many people I've met in the cannabis space that are, that are neurodivergent. There are people that are just, they don't quite fit into societies with the oddballs, with the, the wonderful weird, weird weirdos, you know, we, and we gravitate towards each other and you see that, in drug clusters of problematic users. So then people that sort of develop uh, cocaine problems together but have to hide it together, that creates like a bond. People that end up using intravenous drugs on the, on the street or whatever, they, they excuse so much each other's, they hold a the mirror to each other but then muddy that mirror to keep each other safe but they never want to like let each other overdose but they never almost... It's we do the same with, with people when you go out with someone, oh, my drinking partner or oh, we're just going out to dinner or you end up with the takeaways five nights, six nights. It's all of these behaviors very quickly can become problematic for anybody. Any of us can become vulnerable at any point in our lives. And if society was geared to that rather than this illusion that people have, which again is an ego defense, our brain does it to us. They go, ah, you didn't have that breakdown last year. You're fine. You've always been fine. You're perfect. So therefore you're allowed to judge everybody that comes in front of you. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps, work harder. Do you know what I mean? It's the, this bullshit narrative that, again, I think social media and this fucking device has created that we're all duplicitous now. We have, what did, what's Naomi Klein call it? Uh, our doppelgangers. So we have the online who we are and we have the offline like who we are. Yeah, and some of us uh, don't. Yeah, yeah to try, try to be that person that we are online, offline. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't it, work out well. Yeah, it's, it's so fucking difficult to be authentic when like I said you have all these mechanisms to reward you for being inauthentic Mm -hmm. oh the latest song if you use this you'll get a thousand more people oh apparently now if you open your mouth in your YouTube short uh, in your fucking uh, thumbnail it'll gain you 10% more interest if you change the font to this if you change this to this if you do you know I mean all of these formulaic things the the more people chase that the less authentic their content becomes until eventually it's just the formula until you are just Mr. Beast, where you're just a machine creating a thing for a thing that isn't a thing. And it's nothing, but it's something, do you know what I mean? It's, and it's then others are inspired by that, that emulate and seek to become that. Whereas the people that are just like, oh, I'm really into fucking crocheting. Like they'll find their community, like in a small, but it's it, the system doesn't reward that because it goes, well, that's never going to be the viral thing. It's Mm-hmm. So, so we're all just desperately trying to find the other in the, the Terence McKinnon sort of kind of way in this digital landscape, but they change it every time we turn around. They modify it, they censor it, they delete it, and we've become so used to the idea of censoring ourselves online that we censor ourselves in life, that we censor ourselves with our friends and our family. We don't truly stand on our principles. We don't, we, you know, most people would say that I couldn't step into politics because of the, the fear of like embarrassment or public scrutiny or whatever. And I don't believe it's that at all. I think it's that they're scared to truly have their fucking opinions and put them on out there for the world to see. I think yeah. so many people are terrified of, of what they actually, uh, of people judging what they believe because they've never truly sat with themselves enough to understand what they believe or to question or challenge it. Yeah, well, but... I definitely have questioned myself many, many, many times. <laughs> uh, yeah, the the question, uh, Martin, what the fuck you up to? <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I've definitely asked myself that, and uh, 
Yeah, uh, the answer is uh, more or less the same as well. Like, you know, I, I, I don't know, like, but it's better than doing nothing. Hundred <laughs> percent. I'll put my battery on this camera, try and stop it sliding. Oh, you're all good. There we go. Um, yeah, it's, but I, I think I'm not going to say that if you question yourself, you're right. But you are right for questioning yourself, if that makes sense. Yeah. So yeah. it's always good to double check with yourself first and foremost. Obviously, ideally with others as well, trusted individuals you can bounce ideas off and get you know yeah. supportive criticism and feedback from, and you can kind of smooth off and round off those uh, rough edges. Um, but yeah, you Especially should be you know, committing to something so big as well, like running in a local election. Like it's no small feat, really. Like to mm -hmm. do it. Um. Still, like at times, up oh, dogs there scrapping. <laughs> um, yeah, there's still there at times, like when you know, when I kind of say it to myself, like I'm an independent candidate in this local election, like it still doesn't like it's surreal, like it, <laughs> it doesn't feel real. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it is <laughs> no, it's it's awesome, it's uh, it's awesome. Do you know how many? Are the candidates there are in the field? Yeah, I'm up against 13 others. Uh, so there's 14 of us there all together in the Cork City Northeast. And of those, there is just myself that has uh, drug policy reform included as uh, part of my campaign. Um, there is a Labour candidate in the in the constituency, John Mayer. He actually lives a couple of doors up for me. Um, Labour have uh, a campaign of decrim so they're there for decriminalization of the drug user um but they don't actually entertain conversations about cannabis like regulation legalization or all um so they really kind of drop the ball there when it comes so, to that so basically they're prison reformists yeah pretty much like it's i've got a i don't know when this is going out oh next couple of days next couple of days I've got a meeting down at Durham police station uh to talk about the future of my events and my intentions that was the battery uh, that was holding my camera falling over um uh with the future of, sort of durham city cannabis club and the events that we've been putting on and i'm gonna take to them basically a copy of the national chief police uh, council uh have just put out uh, a statement basically last week saying they recommend that the pccs and the pcbcs the police crime commissioners and police crime victim commissioners respectively in the uk should be seeking to make less arrests they haven't specified where but when you look at it and you go look at the home office home office figures the yeah. uk's prison spaces there is no room there is no the backlog in the court cases as well is enormous. Yeah, we're the same here in Ireland. Like our our prisons are uh, overflowing, and um, they're actually even talking about building new prisons. Like it's like come on, in fairness, like it, surely they should be considering like you know maybe locking up less people. Like in regards like the type of people they're locking up, like. There's no need to fucking lock up people who consume cannabis or any other drug, really, for that matter, to be honest. Um, like, if a person is to be locked up because of the, as you mentioned there a while ago, like, they're completely out of it there because of taking a load of acid or something. Like, the only thing we should be building is a, a drunk tank. Do you know, uh, proper yeah. rooms where you could bring somebody in that kind of a state. Um, so a attached to a hospital it could quite easily yeah. be done it, it's because it's no different than yeah the guy that for his 18th like Jesus I blacked out for two days on my 18th birthday I worked at Tesco as we spoke of uh, a few episodes ago folks you, you slowly are getting insight into the entirety of my life here and so for my 18th they took us out and it was the security guards were big drinkers and I'm not going to name the people but they took me it was during the last thing I remember was Zidane Zidane headbutting that guy because we were watching France in the World Cup final because my birthday is July 9th. And that was it. There was a, a picture of some drink was put on the table. Two days later, when I eventually got out of my hangover and was back at work, I got shown this video of me being sick into a burger like on the steps outside of a food place and just, oh, be, just being just gone, just being pulled around like a fucking rag doll. If the police then find somebody like that, 
that's not the say I wasn't being belligerent or violent or anything like that. I was just stitched up by my colleagues and completely fucking left in a, in a state. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So that would have been dealt with differently. There is a mechanism by which to do that. I personally believe the police shouldn't be involved in that whatsoever. I think we should have like a weekend service, like where there are people on the high street that are aware of this. Look, people are now sessions we keep speaking of. The cocaine has become ever more popular mixed in with alcohol, which makes a drug called uh, cocoethylene, which is a powerful euphoriant. It makes people uh, quite overestimating of their capabilities, their power, and their sobriety, which is why people say, oh, it takes coke to get sober. It's like you may have a more sharper acuity than you were when you were drunk, but you are not sober. <laughs> yeah, do you know what I mean? And it, if we had these services that were trained in this and we just dealt with it like festivals, think of your average festival here, folks, probably your less posh ones, where most of the stewards are right, drug takers themselves and the previous night they were out like, dancing or whatever fucking thing. And then you've got the medically trained individuals and people go off and get third party training and people know how to handle each other. And there's a quiet space away. Like I said, if that was set up, not again to encourage drug use, but to recognize that look, people are fucking doing these drugs. And they're either doing them in their homes or they're doing them away camping or they're, they're doing them in some environment or some way which can potentially increase the danger of them if there was a problem. And they're only doing that because they're trying to get away from the potential of criminalization, which they see as worse. Because if you then go, oh, one in 10,000 people that takes drug X could die, but you arrest one in a thousand people that fucking have that drug in their mind statistically it's, it's more likely them to get arrested which will ruin their life versus that oh the risk of the do you get what i'm saying it's yeah. it's it's an equation to the the youth and like you said because the police are they're not locking up most people they're still targeting through bigotry through racism through discrimination as i was i was talking to one of my, one of my, my mates who works in the uni he's a german german national lives over here and we were talking about germany and he brought up the point of going look this is a win for the german police they get to completely gone to smell of weed can't fucking enforce this we're going to stay away from this but then in any specific moment where they choose and they go oh we don't like this activist oh let's go knock 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 oh is that four plants <laughs> do you know what i mean oh have you got 26 grams <laughs> yeah. like that's that's what they're gear it's still going to be the same thing that they'll still have a, a kosh a mechanism a tool by which they can harm and inflict pain and onto a certain subsect of people and by by doing so keep the others in line yeah and i think until we challenge the notion of that conceptually and i think that's where the argument of decriminalization should win over legalization first and foremost we can talk about legalization and corporate regulation and commercial access after none of us are getting in trouble for it that that's that's the fucking minimum if you're going to go we can create a commercial industry we then i can do what i want at home Frankly, that that's just how it should be. In the same way, McDonald's, I could make fifty burgers at home. McDonald's isn't going to fucking pay the government to you know surveil me and go. Oh well, actually, we saw on his Tesco data receipts that he bought loads of burgers, and that's a commercial amount of burgers. Knock knock. Have you got a license for all those burgers you're serving? I remember what they did with the fucking radio license the other year. I don't know if they did it in Ireland, and they were like, all shops are now, you've got to pay for the money to have radio. If you've got to the public beyond X amount of people, you've got to pay if you have amplified music. Oh, for God's sake. Like, it just, any, any inch of just fun and like, mm, mm, mm. Like, I was learning about pirate radio today and about how that started as a consequence of people going, cute with the BBC. And it was people setting up like boats. I think one of the first one was an Irish guy. I can't remember the name of name of him. Um, but I was, yeah, I was listening to these uh, podcasts a while I was painting, so I only took in so much information, evidently. Um, and then some Brit British dudes, and then they ended in like one of the guys ended up killing another guy because they like took over some forts off the uh, in the Atlantic, and they were yeah. using them. And then there was this whole thing with the courts and and whatever else. Um, uh, Escalated quickly. <laughs> but, but massively dude massively it's <laughs> fucking interesting as hell there's, so, there's a few documentaries I've lined up that I want to watch uh, to, to further learn about it because it just shows this this escalation of control and it is a quintessential example for me of what they do they go there's a thing is there are we in charge of it N no we'll ban it alright you get it you got it you got it we're gonna allow this thing to happen that mm. you sorted you sorted yeah yeah that we've got this and we're gonna open these and we're gonna do and it's them it, yep. it, that's all it's about in this country and in, in ireland is a legacy of it is the class system is still those 
for aristocrat like inherited wealth posh people that are still just like but we're better we we own everything we're the investor class you know we're the capitalist class like you you can't have this what do you mean a seed could make you a billionaire you're not allowed that they, they can't just handle the idea of a, a, a diffused decentralized resource where millions of people could get wealthy that boggles their mind yeah. Do you know what I mean? They, they've created a system of artificial scarcity, of intrinsic obsolescence. You know, they're working on things like allegedly, like the Terminator Seed Project, if you look at Mansato, now Bayer. Um, like, all these different things is just to ensure that, no, but, but you've got to pay us. Are you alive? Are you breathing? Yeah, that's two, oh. two, two units of monetary credits. You've walked three steps, is it? That's three units of monetary credits. You had a thought, that's four credits. Like, it just, it, they're trying to monetize and... and What's the word? Um, sort of increase the efficiency of the human experience through capitalism. They are trying to remove the soul and the spirit. They are trying to homogenize the human experience. You are born, indoctrinated through education, put into useful gained employment for their benefit, and then you spend all of your free time either destroying your brain cells or your body or consuming their shit. Like, it, I don't see any other avenue of option yet that is so small of a line so few people walk down there i watch the bbc and read the mainstream press and live a normal like that's so few people they've designed this world for the the boomer middle class that boomed after the second world war they're all gone they became upper middle class and they became wealthy and they inherited all oh, my house is suddenly worth a million quid oops i'm accidentally a millionaire now i'm a tory like, do you, do you know what I mean? They, they leveled up into such a fucking degree and it's their protectionist attitude that is denied and cut off the youth for 50 years in this country. Sad. That really is sad. Well, is, I, I, I definitely think it was a uh, change coming, though. I, I would hope that maybe come your election there as well, even election soon, you were saying. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I definitely think that we're going to see some change. I think, cha yes, change in terms of different faces, different names. And I think there will be a, a collective sigh of relief in most countries. I think it's the most democratic uh, year in modern history uh, in terms of the number of elections around the world. So we're going to shake up the status quo. There are several countries that have had similar systems to sort of the UK have, have entrenched and, and trapped um, uh, parliamentary parties that I think are going to get the living shit kicked out of them by the youth. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, watching the I've got my qualms with TikTok as I do with every other social media platform, but watching how hard the U.S. Senate went after them, and without getting too complex with the the micro economic uh, micro politics of it all, like when they sort of went after that the way that they did, and you're like, well, what's on YouTube, uh, TikTok, and they allow it's kids dancing in X Y Z, and it's like that's a part of it, yes, but self-created journalistic inquiry and individual like there's a lot of free information just being shared around it's an incredibly powerful platform in that sense as most social media platforms are they're just subject to extreme censorship and i think the youth have you know you've they've been brought up under these systems they've lived a decade plus of the lies of the bullshit and a lot of the millennials and the younger millennials that just become apathetic gen z i mean gen x sorry checked out early and i don't blame them they were smart to it. Their music, their subculture, they had rave, the first wave of rave and all this shit. And they had a revolution and a thing and the system went, no, you're not allowed your amplified sound with your boom, boom, boom beats. You can't gather more than a dozen of you together. You can't do this. You can't, do you know what I mean? They completely crushed any subculture. And now they don't have to crush our subcultures. They just click sensor. Oh, that word highlight, click sensor. So then people go, oh, well, you're still talking about cannabis. Yeah, because there's millions of us. And you go, well, where are they? So everybody's fucking hiding. Everybody's sat in a little room, scared to go, I don't want the leaf, like, on a T-shirt, on a clothing or whatever. I, I can't then be seen. I've got to hide the smell of it. I've got to do it. There are so many people still living under extreme fear. They are still under that fucking boot. And we can't um, begin to reach those people because they're never going to Google cannabis or dare follow a page on Facebook or even listen to a podcast like this. It's... It's a shame because they want yeah, the world that we want to fight for, but they, they, they're they scared to put their support to it because of the mechanism I spoke of before. They don't see that as the populist view. The populist view is, oh, yeah, medical. Yeah, yeah, and hemp is good. Yeah, but skunk, mm, no. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
Uh, you'd be surprised uh, how far um, podcasts like this can reach um, and, and podcasts like my own. Um, I, I know myself. I was say, yeah, we're, we're good. We're great podcasters here. We put out some quality content here, folks. I'm not talking yeah. down our, our uh, no, content. No, no, no. <laughs> but, but yeah, don't underestimate the reach. Um, I, I've had people like, even with, like you were mentioning there earlier about a video going viral and you're getting like 60 new followers. I've had people who come up to me and they say, I watch your videos all the time, but I can't fo- I can't subscribe. I can't subscribe to you. I can't follow you, you know, I, I can't hit the, 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 the like button, but I watch your stuff all the time. So there's people who actually go out of their way, come onto the channel to watch the videos, but, you know, they, they're not following with a channel or anything like that themselves. Um, I've had a few people come up and say it, like, you know, uh, well done and everything that you're doing, fair play for, uh, you know, making as much noise as you do in regards to the campaign around cannabis. Um, I, I'm i in job X. I I can't open my mouth because, yeah. you know, I get I make this much a, a week and I can't lose it because, you know, my house and my family and, you know, and, 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 and valid reasons too. Like, but at the same time, like, is it, is it really? Like, you know, I, I'm just being nice. Like, but, ah, uh, like, is there ever really a valid reason to sell out in your principles? Like, and, and especially when it results in, like, so many people falling in as well. Like, it's not just you, you know? I think, yeah, <laughs> I think the answer isn't binary. I think it's spectral. Yeah, that's true. So uh, I wouldn't consider, say, I get pulled over. This is a hypothetical this yeah. is not going to land me in court here. This is not a video evidence of an admission here. So don't fucking anybody try and use this as such. But saying this hypothetical, I was pulled over with my um, lawful prescription. I had my vaporizer in the car. And for some reason, say there was a few ounces in the car as well. Um, the way in which I would still stand on principle and in dealing with that situation would be entirely different than if I didn't have the other few ounces in the car um, in this, again, this hypothetical. Um, and so I think it's a, a conscious choice that we all have to make in that decision of self-preservation versus, you know, potential harms. Yeah. And I think most people like to lionize themselves. They like to believe themselves that, oh, no, nah, if I see that, I'm marching across the street and I'm hitting that guy, I'm stopping that, I'm breaking that up. Yeah, Nazis try and come to me, you know, like it's, but there's a guy who wrote a, uh, wrote a book and gave a lecture and again, I'm so bad with names today, I'm sorry, folks. Uh, and he wrote, a, he had a, a teacher's a lecture still in one of the American campuses, uh, universities again, which I can't remember the goddamn name of. Uh, and the class is basically called, you would be a Nazi. You would have been a Nazi. And it's talking about social contagion it's talking about like all of these mechanisms of what really happened and that it wasn't like a few it, it's the as marx called them the petty bourgeoisie it was the the mass kind of middle class that that oh well life is comfortable and if i speak up it'll be less comfortable and then when the majority went one way and you go oh, well actually now the consequence of giving this isn't just comfort it's like death so actually yeah i'll attend the meetings yeah i'll do the hand gestures and we'll play the game and then it just becomes drip by drip by drip until you become, and then you get rewarded by that system. And then that system engulfs. And, and I, I think we all have within us have to make that conscious decision and you can't go that, well, I stood today on this, therefore I will always stand on it. No, you'll have to choose next time to stand on it again. Do you know what I mean? You, you can't go, well, I stood up for injustice 20 years ago and did X, Y, Z. So yeah, what's the, is it Lupe Fiasco Bar? Uh, you gave me a baby, yeah, ha, 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 what have you done lately? It's like, yeah, w- what have you done for me? What have you done for me lately? It's, it's. Th- I think that's where we're at. And it's not to say that everyone should be out martyring them and setting themselves up to fail. But when you are given the one or two opportunities that arise in all of our lives, no matter how you live it, for you to step up and do something, then yeah, you have to make that decision. I don't begrudge people for not, making it i do feel disheartened slightly by it 
but that's my emotion and my reaction and not a judgment of the morality, the value, the, the potential of the other individual. And all I can do to appease that sense in when I look around others is to act the way I choose to act, is to be as open as I can, is to be as as forthright as I can without, again, risking my own sort of freedom, liberty, and, and, and life. But then there is... Um, I can remember this person, Benjamin Franklin quote, uh, which is the, you know, he who surrenders uh, liberty for safety, uh, he who surrenders liberty for safety deserves neither. And, and there's a part of me that kind of feels that what's the point of yep. saving myself if it came up? Not only would I invalidate my entire experience and what I've been through, but it's it's kind of what I'm training for. Touch wood, obviously, I don't want to be sat in a prison cell or put in a point where it becomes a serious fucking thing at some point. But every day I tell myself I'm prepared for that and I prepare for that. Every day I keep an awareness of that because mm -hmm. it's what I want, a larger conversation. It's it's part of the wonderful discretion I used to have with Durham Police that I'm very much hoping to rebuild under a new administration uh, with, with the new bunch. Um, is that it would be much more of a headache for them to try and shut us down and stop a few hundred of us gathering and trading and, and looking after ourselves and providing best practice and harm reduction, education, awareness, and, and, and yeah, service, um, than it would to come after us. You know, it's easier to just kind of leave us alone and work with us, have the conversation, and I'm hoping to be far bolder than we have previous and to go, look, we know that the answer now is community. It's being together. We we self-regulate. We self-educate. We we bring each other up. There are obviously bad actors and bad people that are out there, unfortunately, still scamming people. Oh. There are people out there doing all sorts of terrible shit. And the way we combat that is not to sit in the shadows. It's not to be quiet. We build spaces and respectability. We create uh, these yeah safe spaces in the term parlance of our time, where others can come and they won't be judged for their association to it. I've got a, a mate that. I, that I know that I I know through helping out with uh with oils through when he had cancer and he's went back into a career and got really quite high up with what he does and he signed the the official secrets act and he still consumes but he consumes in such a way of power not what I would consider to be paranoid because he has to he has to like make sure he doesn't smell before he goes into his vehicle at all like he changes clothes he when he travels he flies into another country to then get what he needs to do. like he does all of this. And it's to me, it's like, what the fuck? And he's like, well, yeah, but if I get one time in that one thing, the entirety of everything I've built is is destroyed. Even when he's like in a, a lawful region, that's what's so so mental is that, yeah, there is there is this. It's all it comes down to mor morality. There is this full moralizing by the the prohibitionist or now as I call him the neo legalizationist to go. Well, this thing's terrible, but all right, if this thing's terrible and it exists, we will grow it for you. We will sell it to you. We will tell you how much you're allowed, where and when and why. Yeah. Did, was, uh, just, sorry. Did you see, was it uh, Nicki Minaj who got caught there the other day coming out of uh, Holland? Uh, she was on her way over to Manchester. Like yeah. even somewhere where it's all legal, like, do you know that? Was it, was it, was it, was it her or was it one of her security? Wasn't it a bunch of pre-rolls? I, I'm not too sure what it was. Uh, all I heard was it was in her bags anyway and that uh, she got detained um, and her concert then got fucking re had to be rescheduled and as a result like, but like I, I, when I was bringing her up on the, the 420 News when I was highlighting that one uh, I was highlighting you know how fucking how cannabis prohibition there again like done far more harm again than cannabis ever could have because but like quantifiably you know, god god yeah I mean it I make the people having to, to miss that concert that night, you know, finding out late in the evening, oh yeah, shit, that concert that we're ahead, just probably getting ready, going out the door to it's now cancelled or rescheduling it there for another night or something, you know. Um many yeah. people got had to babysitter and all of that like I and know this... cannabis prohibition, just because you can't bring a little bit of cannabis from Holland to the UK where like when when you really think about it, like come on, how much cannabis coming into the UK anyway legally already? Um, yeah, and illegally. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, just reminded me of something of the hypocrisy of some. In twenty twenty two, Snoop Dogg 
uh, made a, a public anecdote of basically stating that they tried to kick him out of the UK for cannabis, mm-hmm. and the Queen intervened and said to the, um, you know, the, he, he was fucking, <laughs> he's done no wrong and should be allowed to stay. Um, and again, it's just the the double standards there. <laughs> yeah, 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 and it's like. Nicki Minaj is not necessarily fully known for cannabis, but she is of a genre and of a culture that now, because of America, cannabis is becoming quite a strong and intrinsic part. It's always been a part of music. It's just always had to be hidden. And so now there is these spaces and ability for people to rap about it and people to create these careers. And yeah, there's there's some uh, collabs that I'm not necessarily happy with when like True Believer and Wiz Khalifa, et cetera, and others that I'm not going to name because uh, yeah, it just, it is what it is. Um, but in other ways, then people that have authentic connections are being able to then connect with cannabis brands. I'm thinking there's some seventies four piece band that I can't remember the goddamn name of, and they were called country ish and they'd always sung about cannabis and stuff, and they've now got a cannabis brand and okay, fair play. But if Jay Z gets his way through fucking Rock Nation, there's gonna be like a Alicia Keys Kush and shit like that. And I'm like, Yeah. Really? What's the you know so that it, but my point being is that if then that's part of the thing of it, you really and the hypocrisy is like you say of the legality of, of various of the products is if she had it in a medical tub and a magic piece of paper, fucking nobody would have batted an eyelid. Nope. It's... Yeah, that, that's that's the insanity of it, and it's all the same thing. I, I think Alan Robinson done a very good video there one time about it, like you know the the whole cannabis thing versus medical cannabis, mm. and yet bananas and medical bananas for his potassium deficiency. You yeah. know, but they're the fucking same thing. There's just two bunches of bananas. Like, and it's the same thing, really, when it comes to cannabis. Like, uh, one person's medical cannabis is pretty much the same as the next person's fucking skunk, as they want to call it. Um, maybe there might be a bit more uh, standards, quality uh, assurance there for a person's medical cannabis, at least you would hope. So anyway... Um, that that hope would be so. only yeah, hope so. <laughs> yeah, um, you would hope that would be the only difference. Um, yeah, yeah, it's 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 mental. The taxonomy of the plant and its traits and structure across the accepted three subgenus of cannabis sativa, relative root, or sativa, and indica expresses in every single form of cannabis as we know it as the sub branch of cannabis family. Wherever you put, oh shit! Wherever you find a seed of cannabis, of cannabis, it's cannabis. Mm-hmm. It it just it, it and it sh- it should be as as simple as that as when you go, well, a cactus is a cactus is a cactus. You know, well, like sort of a medical cactus. So that that cactus is only for for cactus leather, but only that cactus. Why can't that cactus? Oh, because that one produces another thing, and and we couldn't. Yeah, but you couldn't know. But we grow this one specifically for that. Do you know? It's it's as arbitrary and as ridiculous as, and they do that like they said so that. They can dominate those industries. Mm-hmm. And then go, well, oh, if you then hemp, yeah, it should be everywhere and we'll grow it and biofuels and all these wonderful things. But then, oh, legislation, regulation, licensing, restriction, you're not allowed to grow it in your back garden. That looked like cannabis, so we're going to raid and arrest you. We can't have people growing hemp in their gardens. It looks like cannabis. Yeah, because yeah, it fucking is. Like, <laughs> it's the, the, the absurdity of the laws of the, like, it's, it's breaking down the science. It breaks down rational conversations. I often feel like I'm going insane when I talk to some of these people. And you'll go and you'll talk and you're like, one, two, three, and they suddenly go Q and you're like, no, four. And like, okay, right, we'll explain again. And you start, do you know what I mean? And, and they still somehow can't grasp that one plant and the rest is lies. Yeah. It's just propaganda. It's just bollocks. And it, because it's been through successive generations, they've been huffing their own supply. I mean, it's me in that paint again. That's what I think. They've been huffing their own supply and they believe that shit. They're so high off their own bollocks. That they actually believe the skunk lies and all of this other narrative and shit that they've created. They came out with a lot of uh, headlines there recently. 5,000 deaths over the last couple of years there from um, the synthetic cannabis, or from cannabis. It said from cannabis. Yeah. Um, but then when you actually get into it, actually, a lot of it was synthetic cannabinoids. Um, hospitalization. Sorry, I think I said mm. deaths there. Sorry, hospitalizations. 5,000 hospitalizations. Um, from 2019, I think it was, um, and this this headline was all over every newspaper uh, in in Ireland. Like, um, so it was a really hit piece on cannabis, 
But when you read into it, actually it had nothing to do with cannabis. It was about synthetic cannabinoids. When you read into it, like most of the hospitalizations that was referring to within the article were synthetic cannabinoids. There was one specific one down uh, in from my here in Cork um, where some teenagers got access to one of these synthetic uh, cannabinoids uh, in a vaporizer form. Um, and they vaped it at school and they didn't have a good time. They ended up having to go to the hospital. Um, and like that, that was inside and the that. But again, that 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 was a synthetic cannabinoid. It wasn't actually cannabis. So like, the, it was a complete, complete, complete hit piece on uh on cannabis because if they were to be honest at all about it, it was cannabis prohibition. Uh, in reality, uh, it was what should be to blame for those five thousand hospitalizations. Because in reality, it's cannabis prohibition that that is uh, bringing us all these synthetic cannabinoids. Like if if we didn't have um, cannabis prohibition, then we probably we we definitely wouldn't have these synthetic cannabinoids. Because the only reason these things are there are to replace uh, natural cannabinoids, which are illegal. <laughs> yeah, we uh, we we've been fucking around with them for for a while because obviously cannabis was kind of a wonder drug in uh the early days of like the pharmacopic uh explosion and kind of the, the move into modern pharmacy away from apocrypty and kind of herb, herb herbology and what is the other one the other thing that i can't think of right now uh, but we went into this thing of like standard white drugs hydrochloric formed white powders that's what we want. Easy, measurable, goes into a fucking hypodermic needle. Um, and we wanted to know what cannabis was so we could make the thing to go into the thing. And it was basically to get away to create standardization of doses because a lot of doctors and people were finding great success with cannabis, but it varied massively because of our endocannabinoid system. Obviously, for a century, we, would, we wouldn't know that. Um, but yeah, in the, like the 1930s, they first found the CBD and then I think it was it was Pfizer in early 1970s created, I cannot read that string of code. It's, I think, 10 digits uh, with letters and numbers. And that was the intellectual property for the first what became what we suspect, but can't have confirmation because they've closely guarded their, um, their records, uh, was the first what we would consider spice. I think it's K2 is what it became known as its sort of street name. Um, but yeah, then from that, there was an explosion of novel chemists around the world of people in bedrooms, effectively, in garages. And yeah, people like your shulgans and your more professional outfits trying to play with stuff. Um, and they just created this explosion. And then, yeah, in like the, what was it, 70s, we figured out, late 70s, I think we figured out uh, the endocannabinoid system. And then like the 90s, we, we kind of cracked THC. And I think that was more through understanding the the molecular changes in the cannabinoids of going from cbg branching through to your, your, your cannabinoids and the phasing and the acids and it took us a while i think to get our heads around uh around that shit. um and basically as soon as that kind of happened you get gw pharmaceuticals you get the british state doing a lot and then becoming a world leader and then all of this money while at the same time legal highs and there's hundreds of varieties of spice kicking around which again to me feels like a live experiment that if you were one of these companies and oh, well, what happens, oops, oh, what, what happens if we give it to an, and I'm not stating that I believe that pharmaceutical companies are giving drugs to prisoners. I'm just saying that prisons happen to be an environment where because of the obvious testing in the smell of cannabis, synthetic cannabinoids have become exceptionally popular as currencies. And so from that, you can then get, evidence and studies and if you then allow like i said you said those synthetics to perpetuate you can write headlines like thousands of people hospitalized x amount of people killed from cannabis because in their head in the the way that the guidelines of the media will work oh yeah because when we're saying cannabis that is related because they're not defining it as cannabis sativa l italized or in italics or however you say it yeah. because that's how it should be in whenever we use the latin name for the defining branch term of its nomenclature it should be in, in in italics this is one of the the rules for packaging for the uk that every brand is breaking same in ireland by going oh derived from hemp or the worst thing that makes me feel queasy from uh, from the hemp plant like that 
it's shit like that. It's just lies. It's obfuscation. It's marketing tricks. That to them, they're like, oh, we're doing this so we can have our brand and we're helping people. I'm like, no, you're helping your people and your bottom line and you're getting a small market share for you while taking away one of an, another benefit or argument from the poor geezer who just wants to smoke weed. Mm -hmm. But you can't go, well, I don't have a bad bag, actually. I'm really healthy. Why am I not allowed? Oh, I'll wait till I get cancer, then I can have cannabis. Cool, thank you. Like, what kind of fucking world are we in? Do you know what I mean? If it's good for all of these goddamn things, why are we instead not putting the research into going, well, show me where it's bad. Yeah. Prove to me in any capacity it's bad. Find where it is and how it is and put that into a degree. And this is my argument of me smoking blunts. And I'm going, oh, well, you're burning carcinogens and you're breathing combusted carbon and that's that's carcinogenic. Yes, but within that, I'm taking in compounds that are anti-cancer anti or anti-tumoral. I'm having a bronchial dilatory effect and benefit to my lungs. It's protecting the lining. It's reducing the uh, heavy like water and liquids that would normally sit if you were smoking tobacco or other elements. Like... There's benefit yep. to this shit. People with fucking asthma smoke blunts and bongs, and it helps them. And like, no, 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 no. It does. Another reason you don't want to hear that is because the pharmaceutical companies are trying to fucking perfect the cannabinoid asthma inhaler, and as soon as that'll hit the market again, another reason why they'll come after us combustion people. You're not allowed your bongs and your buckets and your... What else we got? Fucking lungs, yeah. lungs and pipes, and it's... It, it, yeah, it's because again they add, they want to add another process because then it's control. If they then say you need this device, and they happen, oh Dave, do you want to come? Oh my mate Dave, I'm so on a company that'll sell you this device for five hundred quid. That's mandatory because if I find you without it, I'm gonna fucking take your weed off you. Yeah? Which is what some police are still doing in this country. There was a kid recently that was charged. I'm still waiting here. Uh, from what's sort of happening with it, where the police have basically found his weed and his weed didn't have a vaporizer with him, with it. So they have said that, well, you must have been in possession with uh, in contravention to the terms of your prescription. Ego, your Schedule 2 drug was a Schedule 1 drug, so we're going to prosecute you. What? It's mental. Oh, it's, it's, it's like what happened in Canada for the first like year and a half. It's probably still happening in some of the provenances that... You have to lawfully transport your cannabis. Go to the dispensary. La la la. Hi, Mr. Dispensary. Can I buy my my lawful? I think it's like two ounces in some of the regions. So we'll go with two ounces. You go, okay, cool. Put it in your car. Cop sees you come out. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Pulls you over. You've got it in the passenger seat. That's an open container. DUI. DUI. <laughs> Uh, oh, no. or possession is automatic was yeah. automatic they, they did it in Colorado for a while. They did it in several places. Like legalization is not your friend. To paraphrase McKenna talking about culture, like yeah, there's ways that still get you. Yeah, it's it's designed to protect their kids and to give their kids an opportunity. Oh, Stephen, the the marijuana is quite cool. Would you like a business? It's these posh nepotistic neoliberal capitalists. People laugh at me. Like, you're laughing because of the impression, obviously. But people laugh at me when I go on about this shit. And I'm like, not everything. Everything is class war. I'm British, of course it fucking is. And we got all oh, this little island, and we don't have any impact. No, but we have had such an impact for 800 goddamn years that everything still revolves around the dirty money that we help the world hide. And drug money, if they, the world suddenly lost the cannabis liquidity, that is a huge market share. If cannabis suddenly went federally legal, do you think the DEA is going to have its budget and continue anymore? Do you think the idea of a global war on drugs would exist? Do you know how many jobs will be lost in police forcing and institutions? Do you know how many international warrants and that won't get fed? Do you know how much we can't go, the Moroccans and their hash, or these people yeah. and their synthetic opioids? It's, it's all of it. It's it, it, If we win the drugs argument to being first, yeah, health problem if it's a problem. Otherwise, fuck off. If you want a commercial industry, then it's regulated by the people for the people. Yeah, we'll get you guys involved in the CEOs and the money side and shit, because none of us know that or care about that. But if you want to set up a business with the plant, you speak to the people that know the plant. Do, do you know what I mean? It, there has to be this representation. Otherwise, it's just a form of gentrification. It's just a form of prohibition 2.0. And it'll just then be the small people. Oh, we don't like them. They're poor. Of course they're going to get targeted. Yeah, we go around there. There's all this crime. I'm like, yeah, but all these kids from the higher end of states have now got Range Rovers because they're selling weed, but you're policing them for selling weed. Did you know what I mean? It's the hypocrisy and the bullshit of this. Is cannabis is a resource. It's, it's growing your way out of poverty. It's, it's But if you've got the ability, and anyone can grow mid-weed, can you put seed in dirt and pour water? Yeah, you'll get mid-weed. 
If you then yep. care to do the research and to learn and to apply the practice and to, to, to master your craft, you'll learn to grow good weed. Anyone can. Easily. And it's it's not the same as like, oh, vegetables and rare. No, like, honestly, you'll be pumping out shit that's better than most of the dispensaries in the legal regions. You'll be pumping out definitely most of the stuff that's better, better than most of the stuff that's in the, the lawful medical market here in the UK. Yeah. And you'll be self-sufficient and learning a skill for life. And you'll be taking the autonomy of your healthcare. Do you know what I mean? You'll literally be like, nah, this, this is mine. Or if you're not using it in that sense and you still want to consume cannabis, then you're being able to say to yourself, I'm not promoting other criminality. If you believe the lies that it's causing all these problems, I don't personally. I know there are bad people and bad actors doing bad things, but I know most of the dealers I know that when they're fed, uh, sorry, when they're, they're uh, sold up, you know, their kids yeah. are fed, their bills are paid. The money, where does that go? Straight back into Tesco, back in the local economy. Wait, well, part of it, obviously, it gets siphoned off through the capitalist shite but it stays with us whereas where do you think the money from del getty or from fucking bro or any of these other entities is going to go i guarantee you they're going to set up loopholes so oh tax oh no we're, we're we're registered in the caymans or we're registered in the isle of man actually um do you know what i mean they're gonna they're gonna further take the cash out of our communities the same as the albanian groups have been doing the same as the the fucking uh, Eastern Europeans were for a while where they'd come over here because they were an easy market that set up in really run down areas, set up grow houses, big crops, move that to the big city, make yep. your money, split that money, reinvest some, send the rest back home. That's exactly what the capitalists are going to do under legalization. We're, we're going to further impoverish ourselves. Whereas if I could grow 10 plants and then sort out three people, then that would move back into that and back out. Do you know, it, it, yeah. We we could live like that. We, whereas if they set up the system to only be like, no, but it's got to be billions and millions and tens of, you know, because that's what they've done in Canada. The the there were companies that they've pissed on like probably tens of billions for singular companies at this point that are still dysfunctional, that still don't work, they're still not profitable, even on the stock exchange that they rig by buying back their own fucking stock. Like they're not even getting good at their own game anymore. Like I said, and it's because there aren't these champions. So I say in the smallest way not to diminish what you're doing, but is in the first step that what you are doing is that small, that first action toward it in some way. I know that might sound a bit hyperbole, but if it inspires one other and that inspires another and that inspires... And like it's, it, We have to find the ways to have these conversations to impassionately fight for our rights and our humanity. We live in this air, war, air quotes, walk culture, apparently, and we're having everybody's freedoms represented and we're all diversity, we're all inclusive. And it's like, then why are my friends in prison? Why are they still facing prison? Why could you still tackle me for, oh, I can vape in my car, but if I smoke in my car, oh my God. Do you know what? I can buy the weed from the government, but if I grow my own weed... Like it's these systems don't make sense, and until enough of us make enough of a fuss that it becomes profitable for the the clickbaity mainstream to go, oh, a million cannabis people are going to do X Y Z, or this gathering, or this space, or they'll join this movement. I mean, I know we shit on petitions. I still sign some petitions. Like anything we can do in some way that draws blood shows the fa fallibility of of the system. And I don't mean that analogy in, in an actual act of violence. I mean, by whatever way we can penetrate through their protectionist system to force them to have to justify the unjustifiable, we win. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the best way to, to get them to have to justify what it is that they're doing will be come the next election, especially for yourselves over there, is uh, to make sure that there's candidates there to, to, to challenge them. And they're fucking, mm -hmm. you know, um, some of their uh, bigoted views, uh, because like as, as as soon as you call them out and like uh, put put the argument there out there, it it doesn't stand up. It doesn't stand mm -hmm. up like they 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 can't put back any lo logical uh, reasoning that they keep prohibition in place outside. Ah, drugs are bad, you know. Our drug dealers mm -hmm. are bad people, or you know the the usual old, you know. Yeah. They're not really giving you any um, honest answers. Um, so it was just some misinformation. So uh, I think that'd be the best place to, to get them is uh, come the next election. So uh, if, if we can get more people to definitely step up and challenge them at that point, um, that's where we'll make a difference. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I mean, 
going to get criticism for this as I always do. And there's, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of apathy. And I think fucking Russell Brand has a lot to, uh, like a lot should stop with him in terms of voting apathy of my generation in terms of his when he was back doing the trues and uh, all of that shit and on a campaign was speaking with Paxton and others basically being like why we shouldn't vote and for all I agree with some of the sentiments and, and can sympathise with the position Wait, I, that you shouldn't vote? That we shouldn't vote, yeah. The, the, and, the, and the media promoted him because obviously they wanted to disenfranchise the youth vote uh, to to push uh, David Cameron uh, uh, which obviously didn't quite go the way they wanted it to because they ended up in a coalition. Yeah. But yeah, it, it's the, there is a mechanism where people are just not worth it. They're all the fucking same. And it's, this might sound a bit crude to people, but I believe that being governed under British democracy, a hugest air quotes of democracy there is like being sodomized. And I think that voting is choosing the size of the prick. <laughs> and I think you can choose to reduce the size of it or you can just deal with whatever size is going to violate you. You are going to be violated. Some of them might be nice and spit on it. I'm going to make this is going to be an interesting short, Jesus. Um, so <laughs> my some might help. Do you know what I mean? They, they, it might be nice about it. Like, but it, it's still not, it's you're still going to get screwed. Yes. Because the reason you have that attitude is you're of the wrong class, not because you were born wrong or you are wrong or there is anything fucking wrong with you. It's because of their mentality. They own this shit because they guarantee you won't fucking vote. Oh, 30% turnout. That's good. Yeah. That means 70% of us have gone fuck you and done nothing about it. Yep. We could do something about it. I'm not then saying, oh, go vote for the smaller prick. Yeah, you can in some areas. Like, I would still advocate for just destruction of the fucking Tories. I don't quite care what comes next. Ideally, it's a rainbow coalition, so you've got more chance of holding them account. I think in four constituencies, if the Greens can get a larger representation, the argument for proportional representation could be made again. And I think that then would actually lead to our votes being in some way meaningful. That means that people really could be in positions of power to affect change. Even if you go to the ballot and you spoil it, that adds to a statistic and a number that helps say something. You go and you vote for an independent, even if you don't quite agree with them, that shows something. Jamie Driscoll came second with 32% of being the Northern mayoral candidate um, after being deselected by the party. And I voted for him. And I voted for him based on the principle of, you guys don't want him. <laughs> I'm interested in that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so we should look at shit like that. If there are any people that don't fit into mainstream politics, but like yourself have chosen to go, no, I believe passionately, vehemently, I will defend door to door what I believe in. Yeah, That's what politics is supposed to stand for. I don't believe it ever has in this country because of how institutional and how stretching back a thousand years to the fucking uh, Norman invasion that we've had this semi-feudalistic monarchistic system. But I believe that the youth now that have lived under more once in a lifetime events than any other fucking generation that they can get out and do something. And I yeah. think we can affect change. Local politics means that, hey, if you can put a Martin in every fucking local councillor room, it's that meme of uh, the three panels and it's they're in the boardroom and they're asking like a really obvious question and then two people say something stupid and the third guy says something and they kick him out the window. It's That's what we want. We want, we want those people there. So yeah, they might kick us out the window, but being there means they have to kick us out the window. You get what I'm saying? Anything we can do to force them to expend their energy, to acknowledge us, to deal with us, to humanize us, to see us beyond just potheads, druggies, dropouts, dealers, wrongins, criminals, thieves, whatever they pr pr decide to you know proclaim us to be. We only rise above that if we represent ourselves. And that first and foremost, I think it's somewhere, the only way they will ever acknowledge us until we unite in a meaningful mass is that ballad. They, they lawfully have to look at the thing and, oh, oh someone drew a penis. <laughs> so they have to look at that. That's law. Yeah. Dude, do we, that, get through the doors. Show that. If we can get, oh, voter turnout record numbers, but half of them spoil the ballot, then how can we not talk about proportional representation and getting everybody that you can think of, your Dave down the road who's like, oh, you know what? You'd be good for politics, man. You'd be good in the council. You care about this spot. Actually having people from places they've grown up in fighting for those people in those places. A novel idea, I know, but it could be done again. We could have individuals that know their region fighting for what is right for their region rather than some prick parachuted in to what? Massage the numbers to artificially create a consensus to manufacture our consent? 
you know, we've been getting all along as just party men, really. And I, I don't mean that in the fun sense. I mean, they're they're literally men for their party, their political party. Um, and unfortunately, that, that hasn't really resulted in uh, too good of things uh, for the country, really. Yeah, exactly. It's the whips. And exactly, it's all weird that it's all it's party and whips, and it sounds all extra fun. And you're like, no, it's, it's, it's mental. What actually it is. Some, some do. No, I am in charge. Uh, I've been told that this is the rule. You all better behave, or else you're fucking out. <laughs> like, it's like what? How is this in representative democracy? What are they representing? They were elected to represent the constituents. The constituents, yes, they might be party members, and they can vote into that, or at least they could into fucking Corbyn and Labour, and they did it at least for the Tories to elect their leaders, which is how we ended up with three car crashes and prime ministers, if not all five, six of them, whatever the hell it's been. Um, yeah, they, they, they rigged the system, like I said, the, because they can, because we don't pay attention to it. Well, We're are. so apathetic. Yeah. We're so detached from it because they created it to be this way. But if Were we force to... them to acknowledge us... Did you get to watch any of that Citizens' Assembly that happened over here? Hmm. Ireland had a citizens' assembly there. Uh, it was basically 99 citizens got together and they had a discussion on Ireland's drug policy. Um, they got uh, a number of presentations over, uh, I think it was uh, a, w a weekend, a month, for six months. I think that's how it ran. And anyhow, uh, it was uh, six uh, six sessions anyway in total that they, they had. Uh, and at the end of it, then they had a vote. Um, the outcome of the vote, basically, to, to cut a long story short, uh, there was a massive, massive rejection of the status quo. 87% of the citizens at the Citizens' Assembly actually rejected the status quo, which is our current approach to drugs, uh, i.e. that the criminalisation of uh, drug users is wrong, our current approach uh, and how we treat drug users is wrong. Um, and what they voted for then afterwards in the uh, when they were voting on like what kind of an approach that we should be taking um, they voted for a comprehensive health led approach um, so that that was when was that that was uh, October now uh, I think that's when that ended <clears throat> or maybe even a bit longer ago but still nonetheless the government have done absolutely nothing on it Um the citizens, the the massive rejection of the status quo, um, undeniable the direction they wanted the government to be heading in, and we've not taken a, not even a creek forward, <laughs> uh, in that direction, um. So you talk about like fucking um proportional uh, representation, uh, a democracy, um doesn't feel very democratic uh, from our point of view at the moment uh, given the fact that like you know while, while we had the citizens assembly which was uh, a very democratic tool uh, I thought I thought it was a, a great exercise uh, an amazing process um, and I thought it was very fair as well in terms of like the outcome of it um, like in terms of like saying all right this will be a representation of like what the Irish public wants mm -hmm. 99 citizens the, the citizens were selected, were very carefully selected based on like gender, age, fucking socioeconomics and all of this kind of stuff like, um, to make sure that they got like fair representation right across society. They went all this effort and they done nothing. We're, we're now looming close to an election where it, we potentially could have a completely new government come in and take over and that Citizens' Assembly actually doesn't even matter anymore then at that point. Yeah, and just sort of restarts the process. I mean, that's what exactly. is likely to happen uh, with rescheduling and Biden and the election in the US is it wants to be on the table to look progressive and it's the minimum that kind of can be offered and it speaks to everybody can in print their own version of good on that. If you're involved in the industry and you make your own money, like they're seeing that as a win in so much way. There are some brilliant people producing great content and naysayers and other individuals that see it as I see it as being 
first and foremost a gimmick to would try and win the election and then it'll be mothballed or worse a very insidious kind of move to capture cannabis by effectively the opioid lobby um to as they have been seeking to do for a while to move away globally from opioid uh, uses for pain management towards cannabinoids as pain management and obviously they don't want to lose those cash cows of people that are killing themselves to get opioids and then killing themselves on the opioids to suddenly be able to grow their own cannabis they lose a massive market share um i go for but, profits yeah i'm looking at this word and you said it earlier and i can't remember how to say it what's the o i r e a c go on Arachthus. Arachthus. Yeah, uh, that is definitely, like I said, a respect to the Irish language, but I need to learn more of it because it looks like English. When, when I read it like English, it's definitely not what it sounds like when it's Irish. But yeah, the, that, that committee was, uh, what, confirmed? I think this is the end of February, was it? Uh, Mid-February? Yeah, in February, they, they approved the establishment of the, the committee to examine the Citizens' Assembly recommendations. Is that the thing they kicked down the road for nine months last time we spoke? No, that was Gino Kenny's bill. Um, uh, so yeah. in, Deputy Gino Kenny put forward a bill that uh, is seeking to regulate uh, the use of cannabis, the sale of cannabis. Um, so it's quite, uh, yeah, it's a, hope, a hopeful bill. <laughs> um, but yeah, they put a nine month stay on that one. Um, so no, it's not. It wasn't that one. Um, which which one was that there? Uh, sorry, no again. I'm just trying to. No, and I have to get a brain fart myself. Uh, the vote came two weeks after the, the lower house kicked um, your man's uh, Gino's bill nine months down the road. Uh, yeah, just basically saying that they would uh, look at the recommendations put forward by the Citizens Assembly. Ah, uh, yes, that but, was the establishment of uh, a committee that's going to look at the recommendations of the citizens assembly. Um, that was a great. That was a yeah. That, that was approved back when you just mentioned there, like the end of February or something. But they actually only met for the first time, I believe, last month, um, just towards the end of last month. And there's still no word there as to what the outcome was of that meeting, as to you know what kind of a discussion was had. Mm. Um, so interesting. It feels like a lot of lip service being paid to stuff, but when, I, when you examine what's actually being done, there's not mm. good. Yeah, I think, like you said, it it ex it fills the gap between their uh, previous lip service and their next lip service. It basically just it moves it forward, like you said, to the next election, under the hopes that, as they hope every election, that we don't make it an election issue. Because again, we we we've been so trodden down the the long term legacy consumers, people who have been consuming since like their teens. You know, a lot of us lot we we started maybe earlier than we should have, as Tom said the other week. Um, and we've been consuming for decades, and because of that, we've seen these false dawns time and time again. We've heard these words and this rhetoric, uh, but we've seen people get raided, arrested. We've been caught up. We've been challenged. We've been in difficult positions. We've had our lives detrimentally impacted by this continued, continual war on us. And we are so apathetic and so disjointed that we can't unify together. And when we tried in the UK, we had a, a quite a viable movement for many years. And that was just infiltrated and destroyed. That was saboteured. That was, so people were set about each other again. Hold my hands up. Yeah, I was probably a bit more vicious than I should have been because I was fed some bullshit information and was set about people. But then the people that we did go after and the arguments that we made, we were right. History is proving us right. We have to stand together. There isn't medical versus rec. There isn't hemp. Do you know what I mean? There isn't this, that. There, it's fucking cannabis. Mm -hmm. And I don't give a shit how you consume it, what you want to do with it. Me being free means you're free. But if your freedom is predicated on me not being free, again, fuck you. <laughs> like, it's just, it, to me, it's, it's, a, it's as simple as that. I'm already, as you can see, graying and losing my hair, and I'm going to age into this. I'm going to, this is my life. This is my fight because I'm I'm planting the seeds of the trees that I will not sit under the shade of. I'm seeking to, because I truly believe a better world is possible. 
yeah. and cannabis is one of those resources. And if we can start to understand that with empathy, we can approach what even we see as the worst, the most like vicious and, and sadistic forms of drugs. I'm thinking of the prohibitionists here going like, oh, these fentanyl and trank users and these people using crocodile and they're rotting away. And this, do you know what I mean? That vile villainy and hatred and this spew towards these people. Again, it's people that have just fallen to the worst of the worst that more than anything need a fucking hug. Need some support, need some sympathy, need a listening ear, need to be met with humanity, need to be looked in the goddamn eye, showing the smallest bit of dignity. From that, a seed, a garden will bl uh, bloom within them. Yeah, we go, no, 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 all right. I'm going to give you this house and we'll pay you and you've got to do exactly what we say and you can have this and you've got to go. Like, it's, we're creating, like I said, the illusion of existence. And it's it's this manufactured, data-driven statistical, productive, cold, mechanical, Descartian nightmare. We're yeah. not, we're, we're magic talking, shitting, fucking drug taking monkeys. We're mental. We're crazy. You can't rationalize us. We've spent millennia trying to. We've spent centuries producing art and, and, and poetry and literature and music and many other things to try and quantify the things that we barely have words for, yet are so intrinsic to our existence, like love, soul, passion, meaning, purpose, you know? We're so lost. We're so fucking lost. If we stop attacking each other for that, guarantee you we would start to have that that comfort that connection we would start to see each other's humanity and we would start to figure out who the very small group of people amongst us are that are trying to fuck us over and hopefully eventually lead to empathy to understand that they're sick too mm -hmm. the the guy going four million five million or ten million a billion yeah there's, there's probably something wrong with that guy uh, you're saying, oh, no, that's capital, that's good drive. It's like, no, 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 if you have to be far beyond your means, if you are the monkey in the zoo hoarding the bananas so none of the other monkeys have bananas, there's something mentally wrong with that monkey. And <laughs> somebody should intervene to make sure all the monkeys have fucking uh, bananas. <laughs> that's that's a rational approach. We would do that. We do that. With kids, what do we say with fucking kids? You should share. Like, we have all of these contradictions within our culture that I think end in the war on drugs would start to fix. It would be so hard to demonize the other and to vilify them. We could start to see each other with far more empathy and sympathy and compassion and stop othering and going, well, I'm this, so therefore you're that. Mm -hmm. Because that is the basis of all of this shit. Look at the number of MPs and fucking representatives in fucking Ireland that get caught out with drugs. All these moralizing MPs that then get caught with a sex worker or, you know, some fucking pastor go and kill the gays and then he's caught at an orgy. Like it's it, this, yeah. these just mental things where we're just like, no, anybody that says they're bad and wrong for just being that thing, the person telling you that is wrong. Yeah, maybe analyze the information that they're giving you through the lens of action, not individual. People can act like dicks. I don't think that they are dicks. We, we had a bit of a mad one here in Ireland recently <laughs> where um, our previous Taoiseach, not the current Taoiseach, no, uh, our previous Taoiseach, which is like our prime minister, um, he's a gay man, uh, and uh, basically he got caught in a nightclub with somebody who wasn't his partner, um, and he was like fucking proper all over him now, like in in the photo or whatever, and it was all over the media and stuff like. So he got exposed in the for like being, um, I suppose cheating on his partner, but then it actually came out when it kind of was in the media, like. He had to kind of come forward and say, "Oh yeah, well actually, look, my boy, my boyfriend is actually okay with me uh, having uh, other partners mm -hmm. and stuff. Like we're into into that kind of a thing, like." Um, so it was mad, like that. We have a prime minister, T shock of our country, like as a gay man who's a polygamist. He's into like fucking many partners in his relationship. That yeah, wouldn't wouldn't be isn't isn't, isn't... A fucking plant. Yeah. I just can't. It can't make sense of it. Like, how can these two things exist in the same fucking country? Like, yeah, <laughs> it's it's mental when you think of the the acceleration of, of Ireland. I think he. I don't know. I'm, my nomenclature is probably off here. Uh, but I think it, it, was, it would be polyamorous rather than polygamous. Because I think polygamous is to do with multiple marriages, typically or generally, or a man with multiple wives. Um, 
So just just to clarify that, I do have you know a very uh, what do they call them metropolitan Neapolitan? I can't remember the, the the word that's like to be used there. But yeah, I have a very open audience basically. So I also want to clarify the language as always uh, and be direct with what is sort of said. But yeah, it's 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 an irony of what people used to think of as Ireland. So I remember going to was it Dublin four twenty in was it twenty eighteen? You guys had the abortion vote. 18, yeah, I had some. yeah, and you remember about the flags and the stuff, and I remember Latin driving from the airport and just being like the two streets of like no, yes, and all the flags and all the paraphernalia and all the stuff, and it, and you think of like yeah, is this it? How far Ireland has progressed for still being, uh, I suppose, by heritage if nothing else, a Catholic dominant country. And so the church is, yeah, dependent on Pope, evolves on some things and falls fucking face first over other fucking things. And don't get me on to religious institutions. That's a, a different conversation. Um, but yeah, the, the progression that is happening that you can then have a gay man that can then go, I am polyamorous. And actually, no, we have multiple partners and that not to be an, an, an issue. Yet, as you say, then the, the, the plant and yet they'll still use this kind of for religious moralizing but then you go, yeah, but your book says, or the guy that tells you what you your book says, says to you that the gay thing's bad, but you've got, yeah, but the law. So actually, you know, the law over Jesus. Yeah. And then I suppose you got, I don't want to fall into the Protestant verse. It's okay. But the different <laughs> belief of whether the Pope is sacrosanct or whether it's the word of God, but even when it's the word of God, it depends on sort of the pastor or individual, the diocese and whatever that's delivered that in their version. And there's like 3,000, no, it's 5,000 schools, I think, of Christianity or something like that of different diversion the dom denominations etc um but yeah like you said if that, that can that contradiction is allowed to exist in their mind and then the cognitive bias why then they look at this seed in this plant and then you can quote them chapter and verse from the bible is it uh, the two words that came to mind were exodus and leviticus but they're probably both wrong but the thing of like all, using all of the seed bearing herbs of the earth that line uh, yeah. that's in the Bible, like if it means something like that, like, no, 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 but God, they didn't mean that though, because the law, and you're like, yeah, but you believe in, is God first or is the law first? Why is it then interchange? Do you know what I mean? And to yeah. me, I am God, and I don't mean that in the, oh, I'm fucking Charlie Sheen and I'm going crazy over here. That's not <laughs> what I'm saying. I believe we are all God. I believe that each of us are the animating force that permeates the universe. We are life dancing to the beat. We're that fucking. Uh, cornstarch on speakers dancing to vibration. That's just all life is spread out across the universe. The fact that we are a conscious species speaks massively to it, and I think that's what makes us kind of guardians of life, as it were. We should be seeking to better reality, not fucking destroy it and harvest it and consume it and master it. We are but a, a speck of it. And so in that sense, it's my morality and my God that's higher than the law. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. There just happens to be a wonderful correlation that the Christians kind of go right with their Ten Commandments that many of them, people go, well, yeah, of course it's wrong to fucking kill someone. What are you chatting? Do you know, why would I rape? I'm not going to rape somebody. I'm not a rapist. Do you know what I mean? Stuff like that. It's it's basic things that the humans all kind of went, well, don't, I don't do unto others. As, you know, George Carlin reduces the Ten Sins down into one. He's like, don't do violence. Don't be violent. And then I think you, see, when you can break it down even further. Just don't be a dick. <laughs> Literally, that's the rule for humanity. Don't be a dick. If you're addicted to somebody else, they'll be addicted to you. You know, if you steal from somebody, then yeah, somebody will come steal your shit. Do, do you know what I mean? You're starting to understand your position of like that. So that there are some laws, the vast majority of laws, I will follow without ever thinking about because they align perfectly with my beliefs. There are then several other laws that I personally find invasive and unfair. Again, when I'm in the woods and I'm taking my drugs and I'm sat around the fire and I'm like, I am monkey. You are monkey. We're just fucking monkey. Like, how, who the fuck are you to tell me anything? Yep. You may actually be a little rational and go, uh, what we're going to do is everybody, no one's going to drive over 100 miles an hour through the town centre. Why, why? Oh, danger and people. Oh, that makes sense. Okay, we'll do that. Do you, is, what, we get together, we rationalise a thing, we all go, well, here's the potential problem versus the reward. And, and we've done that throughout history and massaged it. And somehow we've hit drugs over the past, we're probably about nearly 180 years now, and it's actually when the medical institutions start to get involved with drugs that we start to have a fucking problem. It used to then just be cultural shit. There were just things you could go. You could go find a shaman and do your stuff. You could go learn about this and take this. You could go find and do that. You could go on a spiritual journey to this. But as soon as it became then medicines, then we had to pathologize everything. And then we had to cure everything. But then we don't really want to cure everything because 
than a cure, then you will lose money. Ah, the cure is you take a little bit of this every day for the rest of your life and you pay us at every step of the way. So it's the commodification of the human experience. And because these things can be medicines as well as, you know, awakening substances, things that make you have metacognition and uh, hyper awareness of one's own thoughts and belief and experience. And you can step outside of yourself and, you know, quantify everything. They don't want that. They 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 they, they want to gatekeep the mysterious. They want to gatekeep that access to God. That's as much as I feel it is. It's no, if you God, yeah, come to our church. You've got no, you, you no, you're practicing one. Come with us. You've got to be with us, so that the man at the front can keep an eye on you, yep. so the others in the parishioners can grasp on you. Do you know? It's these these little. It's the same with Facebook and social media. What we've created with them is these self policing, self governing systems and. I think cannabis is a plant that invites us to rebellion, not my old youthful anarchistic days of let's just burn this to the fucking ground. But things can change. Things should change. Yep. And we should try at least. It's better to try and fail. I saw some uh, Jim Carrey clip the other day which said that like uh, he was saying what inspired him was his, I think his grandfather said to him one time that look, you can fail at not at doing the thing you don't want to do so you may as fucking well try the thing you want to do there is no default in apathy that you will have a good life do you know how many people in europe leading up to the second world war were just like yeah it's fine yeah it'll be fine yeah it can't get that bad i'm gonna be fine I'm not, I'm not trying to be alarmist i'm just saying that the boiling frogs thing for all that's been proven yeah. scientifically incorrect to use that analogy they're just turning up the waters. And again, I think if nothing else, the reduction valve of voting, of even writing, fuck you and run you lie. That's you you're doing so you're giving so you're taking that off you for a moment. You're feeling action against that system. You are throwing the pebble against the wall. But if everybody throws a pebble, the weight, the force, the ripple of that energy, that wall is shattered. It's, we have to recognize that just because you can't stand up and take on the system and fight like Goku, I've been watching Dragon Ball Z recently, or, you know, be like the Jason Statham or the fucking The Rock or Vin Diesel, or these action stars they paint, they almost give us those as surrogates to go, well, you either have to be this strong and this unbelievably hyper and powerful and capable to take on like John Wick and what, that kind of thing, or you have no autonomy or power at all. And that is just not true. There, there are no real John Wicks, and the John Wicks that there are, they're not on our fucking side. No. <laughs> you do don't learn to become like that to fucking fight for us. You do that to oh, fight against not. the benefit of the freedom of humanity, and that might make make a reality that looks far dramatically different to this. But if it's fairer, I don't give a shit because it's going to change anyway. The nostalgia you hold to yourself and you cling to that you believe is the world that you live in, you don't anymore. I say that I'm thirty six this year. My world is already over. The Gen Z beneath me that are coming up, man, they've only got a few more fucking years before Gen Alpha's the shit. And then the next one, and then the next one. And the capitalist system is hyperfixating lower and lower to smaller amounts. And there's just becoming more of us kicked on, kicked on the pile. And again, guess what those rats in those cages are going to do? We're going to go to that drug water. Yep. And so unless we can meet this with sim sympathy, compassion, and a meaningful fucking discourse like the citizens assembly and then actually affecting that power or that mechanism through the halls of power in some way all they're going to do is not just put plastic sticking plasters on this but i think their policies and approaches will actively make it worse yeah i don't disagree with you there uh, to be fair um but hopefully we can uh make sure that it doesn't um you know there's been a lot of work and effort there to be put into it now uh so let's not lose hope <laughs> 100% I'm trying trying to remain ever more optimistic and this is what I'm saying of like change is change and change is neutral in this sense it doesn't have to be good or bad anything different that shows that things can change is stimuli enough is motivation enough should be enough for you to recognize that, that anything can change that you are still capable Today, you could get off that couch and choose to change your fucking life. You could sell your house, move to the other end of the world. You could completely become a different person if that's what you wanted to do. You could really tear down roots and start connecting with the people, speaking to your neighbors and helping out the elderly woman across the street. Do you know what I mean? We, we could all do far much more 
but I, I meet with great sympathy. I watched a, a Johan Hari interview recently. Fucking love Johan Hari. And his recent book is about Ozempic and the obesity crisis and these, these yeah. drugs. And he's, he says that he used to believe that willpower was enough until he started these drugs and until he started like really understanding and getting to grips with his relationship with food because he'd been obese sort of all of his life. And I think we we need to adopt that kind of framing in a way of going that it is fucking hard. We can't just, oh, put the phone down or whatever. Most of us of my age or your our age, we've had these things for 10 plus fucking years every day several hours it wakes us up in the morning with its noise we are burdened to it every time it calls everything you know what i mean we we weep with it and mourn with it we celebrate with it we capture every moment we see the world through we experience it through the camera and it we're so disconnected and the actions like i said that are going to change that the world i don't think you're going to come through this these may have a tool to put a part to play in connecting us to get together but when they control the messaging apps, when they control the social media, they control what goes viral, what's allowed to be seen, what's allowed to be uh, digested by the masses, then they've got this inbaked sort of censored uh, self-denying system. So again, the real world thing you can do is make sure that you're registered to fucking vote if you're in the UK. Now, when's your elections in Ireland? Uh, the general election, there's going to be another general election and it has to be held by March of next year. Uh, you've got the same sort of mechanism we do that can call it when the like sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so the local election, that's happening on the 7th. So that's uh, happening Friday. I think the vote is actually happening. Um, so this Friday coming. Um, yeah. And then any time between now and March they can call that general election. We are. So, all right, if you're in Ireland, out to you, get registered to vote, folks. Get registered to vote, folks. Anyone that's saying, oh, I don't want to be in a register, you're already on a register. You are more tracked by that little black box than any government fucking database could ever track you at this point. Like, there is no anonymity. Like, you already participate and live within that system. Like I said, if you're going to go down there and draw a, a big old dick and balls on that, that's the democratic process. People died and fought for that. And I know we might disagree on various parts of it. Frankly, a vast majority of the British Empire in history. Um, but if nothing else, this idea should be then perpetuated because I truly believe through that mechanism, we can affect enough change in the chambers where if we get proportional representation, we tear this bitch open. I think it was 2015 we had a vote for it in the UK and they pulled out every single dirty trick. I mean, they went harder than they did during the Scottish independence campaign of propaganda and bullshit and sabotaging to, to make sure that people didn't vote for it. And I think until, like I said, there's more democracies now that are looking to it. I think this year, imagine if the majority vote in the Western democracy, the Anglosphere, was fucking nobody. People voted, they went out, registered, fucking went down there and they voted nobody. They voted dick and balls. They voted whatever. Because again, that that's recorded, that's data. For all them, the journalists are captured or whatever, they'll report on that. And then that'll give rise to more things like the People's Assembly and these alternative, uh, sorry, Citizens Assembly and like People Before Profit and other entities and movements that can galvanize into political forces because politics shouldn't be a dirty word. When you're sat in the pub going, the pint of this, the price of this pint, oh, yeah. fucking boats and immigration, oh, fucking kids' schools and potholes and rah, rah, and you go, oh, don't talk about politics to me. Everything is politics. Yeah. And the reason shit's getting worse is because we won't fucking talk about it. We have to start talking about this. Very on our heads and sun's not helping at all. It hasn't helped uh, and it never will. <laughs> so, no, it's yeah. like. Yeah, so what's the fucking thing that the middle class say or the upper middle class is? I know you don't talk about uh, wages, ages, and religion, I think, with the, the things. And it's like, no, we talk about all this shit. Like, we have to be open. If you can't handle verbalizing your belief and then having some criticism to it, maybe you should check your belief. Yep. Just saying, I'm just saying, as somebody that has some quite uh, eccentric beliefs, <laughs> but is more than willing to de debate and discuss them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Any good advice, I'll check our beliefs. If, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's just what it's one of the things I, you know, we talk about like anxiety 
and uh, mental illness and sort of neurological diversity and whatever else, uh, neurological diversity. Yeah, the, I think that anxiety is a gift in some way. Obviously not when it's turned up to 11 and it's paralyzing and it's destructive, but I think you going and stopping before you say the thing is, is pretty important. I think it's an intrinsic part of the human experience. The same with depression, the same with any of these things that we're trying to patch ourselves out of, whether it be through food, sex, socialization, social attention and clout, drugs, uh, many other things, you know, the or constantly trying to reinvent ourselves and oh, but the next year, next year, the, all those kind of uh, myths and narratives that we follow. The, the answers aren't in that. The answers are in, I'd say, firstly, a true acceptance of reality, what the fuck actually is. And that comes with stopping and asking the guy next to you, like, do you see the giant elephant? All right, cool. There's an elephant, right? But if we're going to talk about the fucking elephants right now, we're going to die from elephants. There's too many elephants. It's like we're walking and going la, 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 through, through an enclosure of thousands of them and we're just not allowed to talk about them because there are all these subjects, all of these things that have these artificial binaries and only certain individuals are allowed to discuss these things. And it's like, no, everything is spectral. And the guy with the most insane idea should be given a voice in some way as much as all the people that have the consensus because if his idea is so insane... It won't amount to anything. But if you start censoring that guy, guess what? A whole bunch of these people from the bell curve start going, why this guy? What's this guy saying? What's this guy doing? And then you end up with an in inverse thing where, again, they get risen to a sort of power. And we've ended up with such a polarized world where you have to pick one extreme or the other. And I'm not saying as a point of a centralist, I'm obviously part of, I guess, one extreme, whether I like it or not because of my politics. But I still think that I can sit with people who have repugnant opinion, what I believe are repugnant opinions. We can debate and discuss them. And then after that debate and discussion, we can still be social. Mm -hmm. It's their action. If they were acting upon their shit, but most of it is their capitalists that aren't capitalists. The people that will fight tooth and nail to defend capitalism without having any capital, complaining that they'll never own a house, that their kids will have to rent forever that they'll never have a pension, they'll never retire, yet defend tooth and nail neoliberal capitalism because, well, socialism's a bad word and Corbyn's a bad guy. Like, it's there's just so much that sort of happened in this pollution when if we didn't have to have the, they're the, the options, if it could be... A, well, actually, I'm 37 degrees to the right, so that's my position. Oh, I'm about 26 over here and there, and most people, rational people, frankly, have left and right-wing opinions in the classic Overton window. Yeah, I struggle. I was asked that question there recently, left wing or right wing, and I was just like, I don't define myself as like, I'm, I'm human, I, I like I'm fluid. Like, you know, I have opinions that are on that side, I have opinions that are on this side. Um, I wouldn't put myself into a box and call myself like left wing or right wing or centrist or anything like that i'm i'm mm. human <laughs> and i think that's that's the healthy way to sort of approach the divisional uh conversation because you're only really asked that to be like are you my team or are you their team yeah that's the thing of it and that's what i can't stand and yeah. it's like there's been several events over the past decade that have gone well okay you said i'm a left-wing extreme radical then this event happens i express my opinion and you go right-wing terrorist and i went what? <laughs> I didn't do anything. What the hell are you on about? And it's like the, the, the like I said, the window shifts dependent on the subject. So we have to not get attracted to tribalism and, and um political sort of uh party politics. And it's gone, well, yeah, Labour and jeering. I mean, they sat in the chambers and they jeer at each other and they shout and hey, and it's this performance like football hooliganism, posh football hooliganism without the violence. At least the hooligans had the violence to settle the shit and it would squash <laughs> it for a bit and then it'd rise again and then violence and it'd settle it. Whereas this is, they come up and they talk this rhetoric and this bullshit, this manufactured, scripted crap designed to piss off the other side and further polarize so that all the headlines are just the two extremes fighting. And now what they've managed to do in this country is make the two extremes the same thing. Like Labour and Tories are so close together on policy, it's hard to tell the difference. Yeah, the only thing that's um, left is neoliberal politics. Yeah, all that's left is neoliberal politics. And yeah. the capitalists and investor class have gone, only, only us, only us. Yeah. So the left have spent since the 80s, when the right fucking rose as part of like Reaganomics and Thatcherism and the fucking stock market went up 1,200 fucking percent or whatever the hell it was, and all this money and influence and wealth, 
the left have caused you up to money and capitalism and industry and going, yeah, we'll bend it and we'll do this for you and we'll do this for you, and abandoned workers' rights, attacked unions, attacked collectivism, muddied and dirtied the word of socialism, of collectivism. These things don't mean Stalin's fucking gulags. Mm-hmm. We have to stop the hyperbole and the over-association of certain concepts, as certain terms to certain concepts. Socialism yeah. exists for the rich. That's why they build out the banks. That's why they funded the fucking vaccines. That's why they fucking furloughed everybody. That's why they fucking invested all the money in the economies. None of it was for you or me or us. It wasn't for, it's in getting people to try and understand this. There is an enemy, but they don't come on boats. They come in fucking limos and helicopters. Do you know what I mean? Or they're out there on those giant cruise ships. Do you know what I mean? Living the life of luxury in no ports. And do you know what I mean? Pumping, what is it? I saw the other day, 150 tons of fuel a day. I think the average uh, cruise ship uses. 150 tons. No, 150,000. No, yeah, 150 tons of fuel a day, something like that, that it burns through the average sort of cruise ship. Uh, And this is like the small cruise ships. They've invented a new one that's like, I can't can't remember the number, 20 times larger than the Titanic. Something stupid. It's like literally like 17 stories or something. It's a fucking monster. It's a city on a boat. But yeah, it's like... The point being that there are individuals with such affluence and such power. I mean, like I said before about the fucking the Normans, they divided up the UK when trying to figure out my history here. Uh, no, you came into rule sort of later on in that, and then got independence. I'm trying to lock in my history, but around the, let's call it the Isles, just of the Isles of Ireland and of the UK, of then sort of this Norman rule and William the Bastard who became William the Conqueror sort of landed. They divided this all up to all of the people that the tribes and stuff that helped them smash the Saxons and fucking you had Vikings over here and you had Celts and da 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 da, and they then gave that land to these people and effectively through. Um, intergenerational fucking passing on of, of the wealth and the lordships and the titles and for all this was only really truly dismantled in 1999 was the lord system truly broken we have the house of lords but that's like elected air quotes elected <laughs> and that's bought in but it used to be that no well i'm the 17th grandson of this guy i have all this shit why because oh we 17 of us ago he helped them kill those people so they rewarded him by giving him all this stuff and it's it's still under that system now. A thousand years after the Norman invasion, the majority of resource in the UK is in Norman heritage. Like the the all of the lands, and you fly over the UK, and you're like, oh, there's nothing here. Like ninety odd percent of our land isn't built on, and we go it's farmland. And you go, yeah, but have you ever seen a farm? It's not. It's the Lord and gentry, uh, ladies of the, the gentry. It's aristocracy. It's inherited bullshit, or it's the fucking the duchy in Cornwall and shit. It's all of this these quasi systems of bullshit that are made into corporations to ensure that the rich stay rich and get richer off the assets that make more than the people that live in those assets or on those assets. Your house that you live in goes up in value more than the average salary in this fucking country. It's probably the same in Ireland. Yeah, terrifying that just your house sitting there existing. And you killing yourself to afford to live in it. And it's got more value and meaning in society than your existence and your family that live in it. It's heartbreaking, man. No, it's not right. I've said I'm not going to be a downer here, so I do apologize for leading into that. But yeah, this is why, again, you should vote people. You want to laugh and say, oh, it never changes nothing. They're all as bad as each other. Go back to my prick analogy from earlier. I'd rather have the smallest prick possible. So please. Both small dicks. <laughs> I don't know, that works. It kind of works. But yeah, uh, all right, let's have a quick, few quick fires and I'll let you go because I'm aware of the time and obviously just getting yeah, a course, bit into course. the evening. Um, I'm just going to read my notes here. Uh, so we've gone through the Citizens Assembly. Uh, oh, so the... Is it Guardi or Guardia? How, I keep forgetting mixing it up with Spain in terms of how you pronounce your police. Guardi. Guardy. 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 I always feel like I'm putting on an accent whenever I try to speak things Irish. <laughs> I think you kind of have to a little bit. Um, anyway, their commissioner, uh, Drew Harris, recently claimed that high strength cannabis uh, available in the Republic is causing psychosis and long term mental health issues. <laughs> Any thoughts? <laughs> that's, yeah. that's, that's the most senior police force in the country, and he's show perpetuating 20 year old rhetoric. It's like, come on, show me the evidence. Like, there, there's. Little to no evidence there at all to, to be backing up what, what he's saying. 
Um, a lot of it's just fair mongering, just coming up with that uh, reefer madness. Could he be using actually? Uh, I'm just wondering if I've got the article still available. I've got so many windows open on this. Um, whether it, you know how you spoke of before about the mixing up of synthetics under the banner of cannabis, mm-hmm. I wonder if he's speaking youth, youth, the mystically. Uh, as a way of saying like high strength cannabis, meaning well, their synthetics they're stronger than cannabis. Ergo, it's high strength cannabis. Yeah. Um, which again, I would I would agree with. This is the weird thing: is you find yourself almost in agreement with some of the sentiment mm-hmm. of these prohibitionists when we understand that it's yes, it's a synthetic drug that has no history of usage in humans. That our endocannabinoid system is designed to take substances far, like hundreds of times, sometimes less potent than this, and obviously yeah. in much more moderated doses. And the cannabinoids that we do take, if you take in large amounts, your body self-regulates and modulates. The worst you're going to do is pass the fuck out. Do you know what I mean? You're going to yeah. go to sleep. Bit of sugar, bit of water, like some some sort of stimuli, as it were. You can, you'll, you'll come round and through it. You'll have a stone over. But yep. it cannot suppress resp- respiration. It cannot suppress basic uh, neurological function to a point of knocking you to death. You will just sleep. Well, there's not a single case of it today of a person going into respiratory failure thanks to uh, overdosing on cannabis. It just doesn't yeah. happen. Yeah, yeah. And if we actually, we could, we could weaponize overdosing on cannabis the same way we do with alcohol. Uh, and what I mean by that is think your chip shops. Think, you know, your late night takeaways. Think of the proliferal infrastructure, the taxis and everything else. If people aren't going on a Friday and they drank two drinks over six hours... They could get in the car and drive home perfectly sober. But we, when we tell ourselves with all the adverts, drink moderately, you know, only seven units a week or whatever. And it's like five, you know, if you lived under that world, you wouldn't need these other things and it wouldn't stimulate, stimulate these other proliferal economies. So I think in a way there is an incentive to heighten the amount of consumption. Look what's happening in America with THC percentages and they're marketing now 35%, 40%, blah, blah. And yet over here, we're going the higher the number, the worse the product is. And that's what capitalism will do. Look at what they did with, with alcohol and shit like that. And they're like, oh, this now micro beer at 8.6%. It's a can of beer and you made it 8.6%. You know, we banned that when you were talking about like white lightning and selling it in three litres for four quid. Because again, it's class, it's optics. It's not about the thing of it. It's about the optics of it and them ultimately controlling it. So yeah, please people, register to vote, spoil your vote if that's what you want to do, or find somebody that you're interested in, or if you really give a shit, get active. Register to vote as an independent. It doesn't take that much in this country in terms of signing up, finding enough signatories to get your initial paperwork together. Uh, Dependent on the race, you don't have to spend so much. I think it's like 10 grand to be London mayor. I think you pay for the the campaign sort of thing. So. Uh, but local elections, pretty stand as far as I'm I'm aware. I think there's paperwork challenges and whatever uh, things that you'd have to like in, incur as costs if you didn't have printers, etc. Yeah. Um, but it is relatively cheap to get yourself together if you're already a champion in your region. As somebody was trying to convince me the other day, um, you already have several votes. You you already have you know some people that would canvas with you, some people that trust what you've done and believe in what you you've done. And I think there's there's a Martin. In every city in this in this country, in both countries, in in Ireland in, in, and the north and across the UK <laughs> and the kingdoms, you know, I, I think there is, and it's each person needs to come to what you came to, of uh, that kind of decision of this is the thing to do. I think if more people did it, a thousand of us, yeah, myself included, I'm probably talking to myself here as much as anybody else. Um, if we did something like that, that's how we start to gain acceptance. That's how we start to gain attention and that's how we start to win back a democratic system that represents the people and not just a small slither of the highest class of them, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, since you get a true opportunity as well to challenge or question at least the, uh, the other candidates that you'll be running against, um, you would hope that at least uh, the, the local media and all of that, at least they've reached out to me here anyway once or twice um done got questions on other things but um I'm hoping uh before the end uh before the uh the actual vote comes up that uh, I'll get a side by side with the other candidates um so I can actually question them. 
that's, because that that's one thing that I ran for because I just wanted an opportunity there to be able to challenge and question these other candidates as well, especially the the one who might be uh, the ones who might get in. Mm. Well, it's it's I, I don't mean this in that way. If from their point of view, it's like we're earning their respect in a way. If we can, like I say, be seen on that same stage. We are not in that crowd as just another statistical tick towards their numbers. Then that, I think, like I can imagine, there probably is some camarader- camaraderie between like Count Binface and Sadiq Khan and some of the other fucking London candidates or the guy from like the raving, crazy raving lunatic party and those kind of like protesty sort of people that do those things. Like the, okay. there will be a certain uh, congeal spirit. Yeah, like, and I think... Again, if we can do more of that and show that no, we can rise to their stage, we can have our name on that same piece of paper. You inspire others, even if it isn't you. You might inspire the one that gets there and gets over that line. And the best you'll do is, like you said, you might get that conversation in that ear. You might win that respect enough to then hold him accountable and go, all right, you fucking won it. Mm-hmm. But here's my policies. Here's our approach. Here's what we would have wanted. Here's you have to now work with us. You recognize me now. The local media know us now. Yep. And then... Again, I can imagine you think, all right, when's the next one? That we'll gives us plenty. Of, do you know what I mean? It's that's the kind of person you are, man. I can see it. <laughs> and it's that that's the thing of it. This is not we are so instant uh, gratification generation because of these things, but the long work that's where the bigger reward is. Mm-hmm. And it's we used to grow in little seeds that grow big plants and we get big harvests quite quick, yeah. But, the change that we want isn't going to grow like a cannabis plant as much as we want it to. It isn't going to be this kind of boom, 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 pour all this stuff into it and it's done. It's it's a long slog with champions of each cause rising as we find them, as each pitfall happens in each blind spot. Somebody else calls it out and goes, shit, yeah, you're right. Widen the scope. Let's move. Yep. And it, it takes a village. And yeah, I hope if, any, wow. if nothing else, people have been inspired by this too. Yeah, go draw a dick and balls on a on a, a ballot paper somewhere, but not like vote, participate in some which way, guys, because it's all meaningful in some way. I know people said it's useless, but we have to believe that something is better, like capable of being better. And if this is the only avenue of acceptable chance, yeah, go throw your stone in the pond, see how much of a ripple we can cause. Exactly. All right. I've uh, very much enjoyed this and uh, I feel good for settling into this. Uh, a bit of a rocky start there for me. For me. Um, yeah, we did all right. We did all right. Um, thank you for uh, for taking the time as always, Martin. Really appreciate it. This will be out tomorrow for us, uh, which will be today for the audience. Cool. Forever, whatever day that is, I guess. Uh, so they will see this before the election. Um I'll uh, yeah keep them informed uh, as we know what happens in future sort of the weeks coming. I'll, I'll let my audience know kind of how you did and what the crack is there. Yeah. Um, but in the meantime, where can people follow you? Keep an eye on you. Where can they listen to your podcast, etc.? What do you want to plug, etc.? Yeah, um, the best place to follow me, I suppose, is on YouTube. It's probably where I'm most active. Uh, other places then Facebook, X, uh, Instagram. Uh, TikTok, all of those other places, there's accounts over there, but they're not as active as what I would be, say, on the likes of X and YouTube. So they're probably the two best places to go find me. Martin's World, of course. <laughs> nice, nice. I'll include uh, relevant links below. YouTube have been pretty good with me recently and haven't told me to remove anything. So, yeah, fingers crossed. None of your links will get me in trouble. Because, uh, yeah, you're out here doing good shit, you're doing good things. Uh, I'll include a news article uh, from local media as well uh, for anybody who is in Cork uh, and happens to be within the Northeast uh, City constituency. Um, yeah, if you do know Martin, or even if you don't know Martin, you live in the region, you're voting for Martin. Yeah. <laughs> vote for Martin is a vote for green change yeah we don't like be big on those papers <laughs> <laughs> alright sweet isn't it uh, I'm going to let you go I'm going to try and do my outtake in one take because yeah I want to go have a nice cup of tea That's and call it an evening I'm, I've got it yeah it only took me three to get the first one so <laughs> if it takes me three to get the outro we'll be fine I've probably got a good outro to put in like I do an outtake in my outro yeah. So I've definitely got a lot, enough material this week to do one, so it'll be interesting to see what that looks like. But yeah, once again, Martin, uh, appreciate you taking the time. Uh, much, yeah, it's been a pleasure. Jeez, we just realised the time there. It's almost 10 o'clock. Fuck, we're here nearly three hours. Woo! <laughs> yeah, it sneaks by, it sneaks by. Yeah.
We're a nice one again anyway, Simba. And uh, if you ever want to follow up on anything there, man, you know where to find me anyway. Yep, appreciate it, appreciate it. All right, All right. take it easy, brother. Good night. All right, peace love. Bye. Well, there you go, folks. That was Martin Condon from Martin's World. Uh, do hope you enjoyed the podcast. Uh, do hope I didn't lose any of my new listeners with my uh, frantic uh, intro there at the start. And uh, like I said, I have been painting all day with it being Sunday and a DIY day um, in a very small space. So I think at first there I may have been a little bit uh, from uh, the fumes from said primer paint. So, yeah, if you're going to paint, folks, paint in a well-ventilated area because there are consequences, it would seem. Uh, but, yeah, we sailed into that really well. Had a, a really wonderful conversation there, as I always do with Martin. I think we covered um, a lot about sort of local elections, of national elections, of kind of the need to participate in some way. And like, yeah, I said, if you want to go draw your dick and balls, you go draw your dick and balls, man. That's your democratic right. And by doing so, you're in some which way voicing your opinion in a way they've got to listen like i said that nothing might change we shouldn't view voting as a like a zero-sum game that it's only won by you winning it's 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 not it's participation is in some which way meaningful that like i said if the majority of people vote for dick and balls then <laughs> that shows something they have to report on that they have to acknowledge this we have to then start having a meaningful conversation about proportional representation about actual representative democracy so that communities like ours cultures like ours can have champions can have representatives and people in positions of power that can fight and champion for our causes that can speak of their lived and living experience and you know create better pathways towards a future that means that any of the pitfalls the problems and the limitations that we have faced as a culture do not face the next generation do not face the generations to come that by winning our war we better the world that's that's the way i see it that's the way i believe it to be anyway um maybe i'm still just high on those pain fumes who fucking knows all right <laughs> it's been a pleasure folks um yeah this uh is gonna get highly uh sort of restricted i imagine by youtube and uh yeah I appreciate any interactions, any love, any any likes, shares, uh, etc. I greatly do appreciate, you know, any thumbs up, any stars, any ratings, whatever it is you do on whatever platform you're listening to. I do appreciate you for showing your love and uh, appreciate you for doing so. All right, check us out on uh, all social media at The Simple Life. Check out thesimplelife.com for exclusive articles, blogs, and more content. Uh, it is a bit sparse at the minute because I'm working on another project uh, with Tyler Green at the minute, which is taking up a bit of my time. So there isn't much um, content populating that site at the minute, but still worth a check for a uh, check out for sort of previous content, especially my Weed World articles, which I will be uploading my most recent one quite shortly once the next issue goes into print. Um, yeah, if you really enjoyed this, check us out on patreon.com forward slash the simple life, uh, where for less than a cup of coffee a week, you can help me keep uh, the lights on in this little project. Because as you can probably tell from these episodes, I am unmonetizable. YouTube AdSense does not want to even recognize me and just declares me to be problematic. So, uh, yeah, anything that you want to, um, if you wanted to support the, uh, the channel, the podcast, the project, then please do. Yeah. Check us out on Patreon. All right, folks, you've been wonderful. Uh, amazing if you stayed here for the full three hours, I think, at this point. Maybe a bit shorter once I've cut it down from all of those false starts at the beginning. Um, but, yeah, you've been wonderful. I uh, will see you next week with, I don't know, somebody. Be awesome. You'll love it. I'll love it. All right, peace and love, folks. Yo, how's it going, folks? Welcome to episode 148 of the Simple Life Podcast. Hope you're keeping well. Hope you've been enjoying this beautiful weather of ours. Uh, I say that just because uh, it's the northeast. I've seen the sun, so I'm going to talk about the fucking thing. Although not too much because I don't want to scare it off and have another three months of darkness. Uh, we don't have a pox of tiny fill. You know, that little... I was going, what is he? A fucking chipmunk? No. Badger? No. Whatever the hell fill is. Beaver? Do you know the, do you know the creature I'm on about, Martin? No. Oh. Somebody figure this out in the comments. You know what the hell I'm on about. The thing that comes out, and if it's easy, it's Shadow. There's like six more weeks of winner. The whole Groundhog Day, Bill Murray, the movie. I'm keeping this in because this is the second fucking take <laughs> and we're just going to keep moving forward. What is it? It's a groundhog. Fucking, I've just said the movie's called okay. Groundhog Day. It's got to be then a groundhog. Fuck me running. Okay, if this is indicative of this conversation, folks, you're in for a blinding uh, recording and podcast.